larger section of I disagree. I disagree. Uh, <laughs> I think you said I will take anything, I and I, I said did. nobody better than Wes Litton himself. Um, so welcome everybody today. I'm so glad to see a much fuller room. I think you all were probably tired of being at home with, with or without kids or dogs or cats or whatever you may have there. Um, today we've got Wes Litton. Wes, hey, how long have you been at KW? Almost eight years. No, almost seven years. Okay. No. I'm ending seven years. Ending Starting eight. your eight. Yes. Right. And Wes is an investor in a market center. He has also been our ATL and our productivity coach and successful big team owner. So what kind of volume does uh, Litton do now? Wes? That's a great question. Uh, we're finding that out again. Uh, we're shooting for roughly 260 units this year. It's a pretty conservative approach from um, kind of rebuilding, yeah. you know. Uh, in January, we put 35 under contract. So it was a great month. I would say so. So um, that's uh, quite a chunk of what the market center put under. So yeah, that was 35 contracts, something around 47 properties. So yeah. pretty cool. That is very so cool. So package deals, investors, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, so should be good. We should end around like 65 million in volume, I think, is the goal. That's awesome. Yeah. Super awesome. And then another Lean member. And I'm sorry. Lean and me. We don't yeah. have a lot of people. Right, exactly. Um, which you know that makes sense. And he's also got his partner Josh is part of our ALC, so they're pretty diversified in there. I'm going and to Emily's on our and Emily's on our team. And Emily's on the team. So awesome. Um, <laughs> You're gonna get picked on the wall. <laughs> just be ready. You might as well just come sit right here. Actually, sit good. 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 Well, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to this uh, gentleman here. You guys, this is gonna be good stuff. I promise you. And I will see you at the end. Thank you, Wes. Right on. Thanks, Shannon. All right, friends, here we go. There's a lot. Uh, I said 65 pages. I'm not lying. It's a full 65. So today we're going to transverse this massive thing called the real estate transaction. We're going to look at it on the buy side, the list side, and we're going to be talking about working with sellers and or working with co-agents and oh, clients. Yeah, clients. Duh, really that part. All right. Before I get going, does anyone have any questions for me? You guys have been fine with the guy so far. Is are used to it at this point. All right, this is Ignite like 3.0. So you're gonna have to forgive me if I use Ignite language. That is not typical. Hold on a sec. There we go. All right, cool. So here's where we're at. We're actually getting pretty close to the end of our course, I believe. Um, so today's obviously work with buyers and sellers. Here's our agenda. We're gonna start with clients, buyers. We're gonna hit sellers. Co-agents, recaps, data success systems. I made a promise to Shanna that I would get through all of this in about an hour and a half, an hour and 45. It means two things, right? Number one, if you're getting a phone call and it is contract related or money related, bounce, okay? So one thing that we always do in KW is we'll educate you to the point of non-profitability. And so if you're sitting in this room, you're not gonna bother me by taking a phone call and selling a house, okay? So make sure you do that. Number two, if you need to use the restroom, do it at any time. If you're texting, just do it above the desk, not under the desk. Under the desk is like distracting. Above the desk, no problem, right? We're all adults. Uh, the last piece is keeping this in mind in your guys' businesses as you're getting launched, as you're growing in it. <clears throat> Whenever you feel like drama in your life is high, it tends to be because your productivity is low. Oh, so weird. Now, keep in mind, there's a lot of outstanding factors in that, but it's one of the rules we use on our team, right? We have a ton of fun and we're pretty rowdy, right, Emily? Right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but what we do is we maintain the highest level of productivity we can. We constantly push ourselves through multiple follow-up days, um, kind of like this general like scoreboard system where every day we're sending out our numbers in an effort to keep productivity as high as possible. In this business, we're only paid if we close. That is the hardest part about being a real estate agent. So when you find that there's a lot of stuff going on in your life, dramatic or frustrating or just bothersome, I always tend to look over at the production side and say, what am I actually doing over here? Have I dropped the ball on lead follow-up? Have I dropped the ball on new lead generation? Do I just, am I just short in general in closings or in volume, right? So it's not the perfect workaround for everything, but just keep in mind when production's low, drums high, and when production high, drums low. All right, ready to go? That's my like one little tip here. This is my favorite, or one of my favorite quotes of the MREA. Virtually every top producing agent we have 
ever worked with has a deep and almost inherent sense of service. Okay, let's talk about customer service. They have a servant's heart and they place their buyer's or seller's real estate experience above all else. They're always thinking service. One thing I would encourage you guys to, as you read through this quote, is replace the word service with system, okay? So in our industry, there's really only two types of services. There's you being personable and communicating well, and there's the system, right, that helps run the transaction. You might call those like transaction checklists or if you use onward agent services, they have a full system of all the steps and processes to get your contract to close, right? So service in our business is communication and care for an individual. And then it's also the systems that we implement to carry them from client to close. Does that all make sense? I know that sounds a little bit crazy, but if you guys need to, I've written obviously my information, but Samantha Davis, I don't want to call her my assistant. She's way more than that. She's like runs our office pretty much. You guys can email Sam. She'll send you a copy of our transaction checklist. Literally all of the things we do top to bottom from when we sign a client to when we close that client. All right. And we're super open about it because I ripped it off from Carrie Prater and Dan Holt and Adam Grady years ago. So feel free to email. We'll send it to you. But inside of this quote, what we find is that our top producing teams genuinely have a care for people, right? And then from there, they have fantastic systems, right? Because when productivity is high, that also means our level of communication has to really increase, right? It's one thing to handle one transaction. It's another thing to handle 15, right? And what's wild is you might not think you're there yet. However, many people in this industry enter their first year, they go for nothing for six months. And then the next six months in their life is absolute chaos as everything starts to explode, right? I remember in my own career, the first six months of my real estate career, I didn't sell a dang thing. I didn't receive a paycheck. Month seven, I signed seven listings as a brand new agent. I lived in Joplin, by the way, and was working the Springfield market and was licensed in this office. So KW is really reciprocal, but I didn't really know anyone in Joplin. So I was driving here every day to handle stuff and drive home seven listings in a single month. Absolutely scared me to death. Like absolutely scared me that there was no way I personally could have predicted it, but we were doing the very basic things of caring for people, communicating with them, and then building a back-end system to start working with them. So whether you feel like, you know, right now you don't have to worry about all the finer details or not, you're right, you don't. However, don't take a low, a lull in your business for, for granted. You know, it's not going to be that way forever if you're doing the right things. So servants heart number one, means we love people. Number two is that we genuinely care that they have a great experience, right? So a lot of times it looks different. If you go sign a contract with, I don't know, any other team or any other individual real estate agent, it will be a different experience than working with me. It should be that way, right? We should mimic each other, but we all don't communicate the same way. So because of that, it all comes back to personal relationships. You've probably heard that a ton in Ignite. I actually saw it on social media uh, last night, Tristan Almonda, fantastic guy, used to be with KW, he was a big tech guy. He runs lab code agents. He posted something and said, your effectiveness on social media is a direct reflex reflection of your real life relationships. I was like, oh, that's so good. How you care for people, how you grow in your relationships with people, all of those things have a direct reflection on the success of your business. In his case, social media is his business. In our case, real estate transactions. All right, we're gonna get going here. Success with clients. So first of all, great agents have fantastic client communication. Let me tell you what this is not. Fantastic client communication is not constant communication, okay? A lot of people mistake this. Emily knows, she hears me in the office all the time. I call people when I have an update. If I don't have an update, I'll send them a text and say, hey, I'm sorry, I don't have an update, right? I don't constantly communicate with people. We communicate effectively at key points along the transaction, right? So as an early agent, uh, when I was early in my career, I, I mistook that. And I was like, every day I got to be talking to these people. Every hour, if I don't have an update, I need to be on it, right? The reality is, is people want to trust you as a professional. Has, does that, has anyone used a CPA or an attorney? Okay, in your processes with them, how often do they communicate with you? 
Very rarely. <laughs> Very rarely. And yet, how much do you pay them? Crap and done. And do you pay it only when the deal or the transaction or whatever is done or up front? Up front. Up front. And hourly. And my attorney charges per text message, by the way, $150. It's a lot of fun. So when you think through effective client communication and we think through other professions, my doctor doesn't call me all the time. Hey, I'm sorry, I don't have an update. Hey, I'm just not sure what the seller's doing. Hey, I'm just, the doctor only calls me when he has something to tell me. Hey, your results are in. They're good. Or hey, the results are in. They're bad, right? Okay, so number one, great client communication is not constant communication, but it provides the foundation in your relationship. What I want to point out here is that what we're not talking about is client communication during a transaction period or once we've signed them on an exclusive. We're talking about a sustaining relationship, right? 99% of my transactions, actually right now, 100% of my transactions that I have under contract are because I've known these people for a year or more in the context of a sustained real estate relationship, right? So general follow-up plans, all the things you guys have already learned about, right? Utilizing those things have created a strong foundation for a sustaining relationship. The other day, I sent out a mass text message to everyone that's assigned to me in our database, right? So our team splits up a database. I took everyone that was assigned to me. I sent them all a message and I said, I have five really terrible houses that are coming for sale in Springfield. The seller would like to sell them as a package. This might not apply to you, but would you have any interest? People that I had no idea were even interested in real estate started texting me back. People that we had sold a house to like eight months ago, texting me saying, hey, we're thinking we want land. So all of a sudden I'm building now my pipeline of new clients, right? It's that type of stuff, the very basics of your 12 direct, your 36 touch, all your social media, that's gonna create that sustaining relationship. Inside the transaction though, they still want you to be the professional, okay? So number two plays off that same thing. We set and manage the expectations proactively throughout the transaction. Anyone want to give a shot at what that might mean? What are what would be expectation setting inside of real estate? I think you guys have talked about this already. Could be wrong. I know the other day we were talking about finding out for sure what the client's need is, so that then I can set realistic boundaries and expectations and get the right properties in front of them to streamline everything. Exactly right. Right. So as the professional, my CPA will look at me and say, Wes, here are the things you need to do in order to save the maximum amount on your taxes. If I don't do them, that's on me. Right. He set the expectations of the activities or the things I needed to do to have the success I told him I wanted. Right. So for us, it's very similar with clients. We have to do a full need analysis, which we'll go over in detail to identify what they're actually wanting. Now, what's interesting is how many of you guys have signed a client recently or met a client or talked to anyone in the last, say, three months that still thinks uh, the market is what it was two years ago? Like everyone, <laughs> right? So like every listing right now is like, well, my neighbor sold six months ago for 20,000 above listing. And you're like, okay. Well, interest rates went from 2.75 to seven and now back to five and a half. That means you're probably only worth about 20,000 less than that to a potential buyer or to that same buyer. So we start setting these expectations about the processes, about uh, pricing, about what they can afford, those kinds of things. How many of you guys have watched the HGTV Love It or List? Is it Love It or List? It? I think it's Love It or List. It. The one where the buyer's agent will take them to like the coolest property that like meets all their needs. And they're like, oh, we love it. And they're like, oh, yeah, and your budget's 500,000. And they're like, oh, this is so great. How much is it? And they're like 2.8 million, right? That's a version of expectation setting, right? Where they ground them to what they can actually afford. Expectation setting with clients is a conversation. It's basically a script, right? But it allows us to ground our clients to reality. That way we can move forward in a progressive manner not always regressing and trying to re-explain things along the way. Now, no one's perfect in that. Even the best in the business come back and regress in certain periods in the transaction. We'll get to that. Great communication. It just creates peace of mind for your clients. That's such a big thing in this process. So many agents want to just push through transactions. They just want to get them through, get them done, right? Why? Because it's how we get paid. So don't get me wrong. I want to get transactions done too. 
However, along the process, we tend to forget, particularly with experience behind you, that these people are literally uprooting their lives, packing all of their stuff and moving to a new home, right? I recently just moved. Emily heard me complain about it for about three weeks straight. I moved myself. That was the worst thing ever, packing up all of my crap and moving it in a truck and trailer. What I didn't realize was how emotional it was going to be. Like the house we left, I brought both my kids home to, you know, I raised them for five and a half years in that home. I didn't think through really what my clients are going through all the time. Like it is way harder than we expect. Not only like the physical moving process, but then the emotional side too. And then you've got this weird financial thing layered over it. Then you've got legal contracts layered over it, right? Keeping that in mind really will help calm them and push them forward in the transaction so they get what they want. And then lastly, of course, great communication just establishes your credibility. These folks, I don't know how else I can say this other than they don't need you to be like the specialist, right? They don't need you to know everything about a crawl space. They don't need you to know the 12 different types of roofing that's allowed in a certain subdivision, right? You need you to be a professional. Like professionals aren't perfect. They just need to know that they can trust you. Right. So your conversations and your communications with your client, it really doesn't have anything to do with maybe your past. I don't even use like my own market statistics in my listing appointments anymore. It's entirely about connecting with the consumer, establishing the relationship, expectations, and then moving forward together. That's what creates credibility. I didn't go to my last attorney's office and say, what other great real estate agents do you represent? Didn't care. I didn't even get a referral form. Right. I met him at a basketball game, right? My daughter was playing on some weird little team that she got kicked off of because she's terrible and uncoordinated. And his son was playing on the same team and we met in the stands. That's how I chose my attorney, right? So when you think through a lot of what professionalism is, it's really about relationship building and then understanding the process of real estate. So that's what we're gonna go through here. We're gonna understand the process. We're gonna walk through that. It will establish your credibility. And then you guys will have this workbook to come back to if you have any questions about it or extra call. All right, any questions so far on communication? One thing I will say, uh, this is just uh, extra. When you have a potential client, ask them how they like to be communicated with. Do you prefer email, phone, uh, phone call, text? What's your, you know, I have one guy, Facebook message. I hate Facebook Messenger. I hate it so much. It's all he'll use. And I've sold him three homes, but every, like, literally, it's all on Facebook Messenger. It's so dumb. Or like Kevin, Kevin pulls clients on Snapchat. I'm like, what the heck? How's that a thing? But hey, it works. All right, we're going to look at three levels of service uh, purpose, value proposition, and fiduciary. Pretty simple. Functionary versus fiduciary. Let's start by defining. Does anyone know what fiduciary means? Emily does. She just won't say it. Fiduciary. You guys all took the real estate test. Come on now. Just call on someone. Some of you took it like six times, too. I don't know if you know that's true. You know? Oh, um, yeah, I got you. Um, like doing what's best for them. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I love that. That's so simple. It's doing what's best for the client, right? Acting on their behalf. What's functionary in your mind? Kind of defined by the word. You're going through the steps, but it's not yep. necessarily in their best interest. Yeah, you're checking boxes. Remember earlier when I said customer services relationship and system, right? This is entirely just system. It's checking the boxes through the transaction to get it done. This is relationship and system. It's listening, it's understanding, acting on their behalf, right? My attorney has fiduciary duty to represent me, right? We call it attorney-client privilege. We all understand that because of TV. Real estate agents have a version of that, right? It's not necessarily attorney-client privilege, but it might as well be, right? You are acting on behalf of your client as much as you possibly can in every step of that transaction. It combines your relationship with them, with other agents, with buyer sellers, with the systems that you have in place. <coughs> All right, dual agency. All right, dual agency. We're going to talk about it briefly. Dual agency is a really complicated thing to do. What it means is I represent exclusively, I don't know how you do that, both the seller and the buyer in a transaction. Okay, so this is really hard. What an it, so it, uh, let me just highlight this the redundancy here. 
dual agency, when an agent represents both the buyer and seller. Remember your fiduciary commitment to your client. Wait, wait who's, I have both of them. So what if the buyer says, hey, my top dollar is 300,000 on this house. If I'm a fiduciary to the seller, I should go tell the seller. See what I'm saying? But I'm also a fiduciary to the buyer. So can I say that? It gets funky. So what we typically do on our team is we'll separate it between two agents, right? So I'll have one and Emily will have the other, right? And that then establishes us to truly fiduciate those clients. Now on, on this side in dual agency as a solo agent, what you have to basically tell your people is don't tell me this list of things. Don't tell me what your top dollar is, Mr. Buyer. Don't tell me what your bottom dollar is, Mrs. Seller, right? We have to really get tricky there. There's an entire page on the very back of our agency agreements defining what dual agency is. I would encourage you to go through it because it's kind of a joke. It's like you represent both people and kind of neither of them, but you represent both. So what I would recommend if you're a solo agent and you find yourself in a dual agency position, that you pull another agent in and you either pay a referral or a flat fee to them to help you mitigate that. The other side is I believe Jim Bullen will run a side for free in it as well. Don't tell him I said that, but he's done it for me before. So dual agency is always tricky. And the reason is you're going to be caught in the middle. So if things go to hell in a handbag and a lawsuit gets engaged, guess who's right in the middle of that handbag? You are, right? So on these situations, we typically like to split them between agents. However, technically in the state of Missouri, you can do it with approval and agreement for both the buyer and seller. Um, we're going to move on from that because that's pretty complicated. Did anyone have any questions on it before we go? Okay, if you find yourself there, give me a call. Call Jim Bull and we'll all figure it out. But it's, uh, it's a lot more than you expect. All right, number one, set expectations. All right. The transaction process. When I sit down with a new client, the first piece of what setting expectations looks like is number one, what it looks like to work with me. And then number two, what to expect in the process. Okay. I believe this one right here is the actual transaction prospect process. Let me skip ahead here and see, okay, I have time expectations. So what I would typically do is number one, we're going to partner with an agent. What does that actually look like? right? That's where we pull out our agency agreements. We talk about, hey, this is what I'm going to do for you as an agent. This is, and it'll continue talking about it in this process or in this uh, slideshow, but uh, primarily you're going to talk about who you are, why it's important to partner with an agent. Let me ask you guys a dumb question. How, what percentage of buyers purchase homes without agents? Does anyone know? I've done it three times. You've done it three times. Good. Yeah, but no one actually knows the percentage because no one actually tracks it because it's so few as compared to the total amount of transactions that actually happen, right? It's actually a very rare event nationwide. Does it mean it doesn't happen? Obviously not. Three right there. But by and large, I think it's less than 3% of all transactions happen without a buyer's agent involved. It's pretty wild, right? Okay. Selling's not that way. Obviously, there's a whole for sale by owner side. But what we're going to do, we're going to walk through, I'm going to walk through this process with you guys. I want you to ask me questions if you have any questions about it. This is a fantastic slide to rip off. I think it's in your book. To rip this off, make it your own and use it in your presentations. Okay. So number one, partner with an agent. Great. We're meeting here today because you wanted to partner with me, your agent. Number two, we need to get pre-approved for a loan. Oh, I love this so much. Check it out. Getting pre-approved actually comes before setting a clear search criteria. Can anyone tell me why? I don't know what you can afford. Yeah, you don't really want to start a search and then them not be pre-approved and you wasted all your time. That's exactly right. Yeah, now pre-approval only matters if they're actually using a loan. If they're cash, we're going to ask them for proof of funds, right? And if some people go, proof of funds, you don't think I have it? And my response is always, no. <laughs> and I smile and then they laugh and then we get proof of funds. So number one, we're going to partner with an agent. Number two, we get that pre-approval. I'm going to highlight this pre-approval probably as the number one opportunity for all real estate agents, period. The person who pre-approves your client determines the success of the transaction and the success of your career much more than you have any idea. Like when you're early on, it's like, hey, I got it from, you know, Bank of Little Rock. Woohoo! Like, but have you ever worked with Bank of Little Rock? Do you know their processes? Will you actually be able to establish a vendor relationship? What if that deal blows up at the very end because they didn't underwrite your client right up front? You know what I mean? So there's so many processes there. So KW has an approved vendor program. 
I would encourage you guys to start there. It's where I started. It's vetted mortgage lenders that you can actually go to and do transactions with. Then from there, you can actually grow. As you grow as an agent, you can actually turn to these vendors, these lenders, title companies, and you can have them help you grow your business. For instance, we do events, Parks and Brews, right? That event takes about $4,000 for us to run. It is entirely paid for by our vendors, right? We establish great relationships with mortgage lenders, title companies, insurance agents, that kind of thing. And then when we do big events or, I mean, heck, they can even buy your leads if you want to buy online leads. They can come to your open houses and stand in your open houses and help you, right? This pre-approval process is much more than just for the client. It is also for you so that you have a confidence in not only the lending process, but also the fact that that client can actually purchase the house. I have shown entirely too many homes to people who actually weren't qualified to purchase and yet had a pre-approval in hand. So what I typically do now is if someone comes to me with a pre-approval, I still make them go get pre-approved by my preferred lender. Right? And they're all, they always throw a fit. Oh, why? And I'm like, well, the pre-approval you gave me is literally as good as the paper it's written on. I have no experience with that lender. I'll call them. I'll talk to them. They'll tell me the same BS. Most of them don't underwrite up front. What that means is they don't check your income. They don't check your credit up front. They'll usually just take whatever you tell them and they'll issue you a pre-approval. Right? That's a fun one. Had that fall through recently. So I'm going to lenders who are vetted by the company who will actually underwrite my client up front by checking income, by checking credit, and issuing a pretty solid statement. Okay. From there, we actually meet. Uh, what we've met up here, we get pre-approved, we're going to meet again. We're going to set a clear search criteria. This can be over the phone, it can be in person, however you'd like. FaceTime is always the best time. Okay. So whenever someone's like, oh, let's just have a buyer consult on the phone, I always kind of cringe inside. Our superpower as agents is relationships, relationships, relationships. So I want as much FaceTime with the client as I can up front, right? We're going to set that clear search criteria. What items would you guys want to know about your buyer's desires? Bedrooms. What else? Bathrooms. Square footage. Square footage. What else is important? Location. Location. Emily, you've shown a thousand homes. What do you like to ask? Oh, everything. Mm -hmm. They want a fence. How many acres? Yeah. And flooring can be an issue if they want carpet or flooring because flooring can get expensive. Yep. Um, what about crime in schools? So we're legally not allowed to talk about crime, right? We have that's in our protection. That's a protected period, so we have to refer them to websites where they can look it up. The schools is huge in this town. Uh, property values go by school districts in this town. It is wild. You can literally have a dividing street, and one might be, you know, Glendale. The next one's Kickapoo, and Kickapoo is worth more somehow. You're like, it's literally like fifty feet away from each other, right? Willard's that same way. Like Springfield Address Willard Schools, those houses sell for tens of thousands more than literally the one street over that Springfield Address Springfield Schools. It's a lot. School district's huge. What else? Hobbies, pets, and working yeah. from home. Yeah, yeah. Then the COVID era issued in this whole, like, do you need an office, right? Do you need a place where you can, uh, you know, be quiet and away from maybe your family or just your spouse? <laughs> the kids are great. Oh, I love. <laughs> Anyone else? What else you got? Outbuildings. Outbuildings. Another huge one. Literally, that came up for me last night. An outbuilding. That's good. What else? Okay, so you guys see this list could literally be like a hundred things long, right? What we're going to do is we're going to build ourselves, and I think there might even be one in your package here soon. We're going to build ourselves a sheet. That reminds us to ask all these questions, okay? You can do it, I like paper. I'm a big paper processor. So I'm gonna have a page and on it is gonna be all the questions I need to ask and a little blank for me to write in the answer. If I don't do that, my buyers don't get what they want because I forget, right? If I sign three buyers and I'm actively showing three different buyers houses, the likelihood of me forgetting that one has two chihuahuas and needs a fence, probably pretty high. Right, unless they're bringing the chihuahuas, I guess. But I'm going to use my own little buyer questionnaire in those consoles, right? Otherwise, I'm left to just do what we just did and brainstorm questions on the fly. Then we're going to go find the home. Obviously, we know what that looks like. It looks like searching for homes. 
We have multiple places where we can search for homes. You guys have to remember this. It is not just the MLS. The MLS is the only location where they have pre-agreed to pay you a commission. Outside of the MLS, there are plenty of homes for sale. There's for sale by owner websites. Zillow has a full for sale by owner section that is not on their main page. You have to actually click by owner or other listings, right? Craigslist is huge. We've sold a few off Craigslist. Um, look at recent expireds and canceled that are now off of the market, right? There's tons of locations or even pick up the phone and circle call or send mail or all the things that, I mean, we, how much mail did we send last week? It's like 3,000 letters to specific areas where we have buyers that just can't find homes. We just started sending mass mail. Like we have a buyer looking for a home in your area. Would you be interested in selling? If so, call us, right? So whatever that looks like, finding the new home is not limited to just MLS searching. I say that, and then the MLS search is extremely important. So keep that in mind. That's largely where homes transact is on that MLS. However, if it's not on the MLS, it's our job to go find it, right? We're the fiduciary. We're working for the client. So today in our follow-up session for our team, I had to text one of my clients. We have sent mail to the entire town of Marshfield in your price point. I did not get any listing leads off of it. We have also now circle called your neighborhood and we sent text messages to it. We do not have anything that fits your criteria right now. I realize it has been two months since I've shown you a house. I'm so sorry. I just literally just layered it out, sent it all to him. His response was fantastic. It's so great to know you're actually doing something. Cool, I'm not gonna lose that guy, right? And he's half a million sell. So we're gonna find the home. Next, once we find the home, we're gonna make an offer. And we're setting expectations with the client. Okay, we're gonna look at this many homes, this much time management, which we're gonna go through all that. Here's what it looks like to make the offer. Negotiating terms. We're back in a market where we get to negotiate for buyers, and I love it. We're gonna go under contract. Vendor coordination. Here's another huge piece. Your inspectors, your insurance agents. This is fantastic. Title companies, lenders, coordinating them, negotiating our inspections, which those are coming back as well. No more as is, I mean, I haven't seen an as is contract in a minute. So I'm excited about that. Our appraisal, which are coming in extremely high, thank God for the last 12 months, and pre close preparation closing and then post closing follow up. I spent way too much time on that. So that's why I'm talking faster now. Okay, setting time expectations. Here's one thing that most agents do. Their client will send over a list of 15 homes. Oh, we want to see these. And most agents say, okay. And they start going through, them, right? The reality is we really only probably need to show them three or four, and then we can get something they like. So it's our job to narrow those down. The second thing is when we set showing times, we need to set showing blocks. So we don't tell people, fantastic, I'll see you at the house at 2.30. You know, we'll go see it and then take an hour and a half at the house. It happens all the time. Just so we're aware, like the first 30 minutes of a showing is probably enough time to discover most of it unless it's a large property, right? If it's a typical three bedroom, two bath home, 20 minutes to 40 minutes is a typical showing period, right? So we wanna respect homeowner's time, but then also keep in mind that in the additional time in that house, we're probably not discovering something we didn't find in the first half hour. We're probably just looking more at the things we've already seen, right? If they'd like to discuss the home further, fantastic. Let's go offsite and discuss, right? If you need to be in that discussion, that's great. Set a time to come to your office to have the discussion or do it on the phone, right? The reasons we're setting these patterns and these expectations with clients is to give you a little bit of your life back. Because when you start layering three, four, or five showing clients or buyer clients on top of each other, you'll have to get really regimented about your schedule and your process. So when we start early on it and we set the expectations in our consultations, then they understand, okay, when we go to a house for a showing, we have about a half hour in it, okay? If they're saying, oh, I need 100 acres, I want two outbuildings, active dairy farm would be great. Okay, I'm scheduling a two-hour showing block and I'm making sure the listing agent knows we're going to be there for two hours, right? Does that all make sense? Cool. Again, we're trying to preserve some aspect of our own sanity. Document expectations. This is a fun one. How many people show houses to buyers without an exclusive agreement signed? Oh, you guys suck. No, I'm totally kidding. No, it happens all the time. And let me tell you, I have lost clients 
and I have gained clients that were shown houses either by me or by other people, right? The reason is exclusive right to purchase those documents, exclusive agency right to purchase. We know what I'm talking about, the buyer's exclusive agency. That document locks them into purchasing with you to a certain extent. We all know in real estate, every contract can be broken, regardless if it's ironclad or not. And the only way to enforce them is to sue. And we understand that, right? The buyer's exclusive agency, what it does, is it sets out some expectations actually inside that document. If you don't know that document, it needs to become your Bible. The buyer's exclusive, seller's exclusive, and the contract. In that document, it actually says, if you have any interest in a property, you will let me know and I will schedule the showing. All communication will be handled through me, not through you, right? That document actually outlines it. And it also outlines the fact that you'll get paid if you show them the house and procure costs, okay? So we're gonna utilize our documents. We're gonna work from written documents. That way we secure the client and therefore we know that we're not just wasting our time. I can't tell you how many clients, sellers, buyers have met with other real estate agents and then somehow they cross paths with a different one and they sign. And the next thing you know, Jim's calling and saying, hey, so-and-so showed this person a house over at Murray, but then they came over to your office for a consultation. You signed them to an exclusive and you sold them a different house. Now this agent's upset. And my response is typically, did they have an exclusive agency agreement with them? And the answer is typically no, right? At that point, I'm like, I'm sorry. There's not a whole lot we can do, right? However, if they had an exclusive agency agreement, then we came and signed and sold them a home. At that point, we have a whole different conversation, right? Okay, so we're gonna work from document expectations. You guys can add additional documents into your buyer packages if you want. You don't have to just use the set KW ones. If you have ones that say something along the lines of showing expectations and you have everyone initial the document, you outline your showing expectations inside that document, it's totally okay. It's not a binding document. You're just saying that they acknowledge the fact that you have these expectations and your showings. You can actually get creative inside of your documents. The other thing, like I mentioned that timeline earlier, utilizing that helps them visualize the process and you get to leave it with them, okay? Utilize your document and your buyer package and your listing consultation package to kind of set the standard for how your process will flow. Communications as well. We already talked about, you know, the communication method that they prefer. We talk about when we should communicate, right? Which is not constant. It's when we have important updates and things like that. And then lastly, the uh, last, I think this is the last one. No, we got two more. Setting expectations on contingencies. 70% of all fall through happens when? Contract fall through. What contingency is used? Inspections. Inspections. Yeah. I would probably argue it's more than that, but NAR said something like 73. Jason Abrams was talking about it when we were up in St. Louis. So if 73% of all fall throughs happen directly in your inspection period, what do you think we should spend the most time on during our consults? Our inspection period. What's the number one thing people don't spend time on during their consults? The inspection period. It's scary, right? I hate future pacing or thinking of future pacing people by saying, hey, in our inspection period, this is likely where we'll fall through. Probably wouldn't use that language, but that's what we're saying. So we tend to avoid it altogether and say, yeah, you'll get an inspection, don't worry. And we move on, right? The reality is if we set the expectation around the inspections appropriately, it can actually be a wonderful time to renegotiate inside of our contract, okay? So for instance, let's just pick on a first-time home buyer. So first-time home buyer comes in the office. I've got $180,000. I want to buy a three-bedroom, one-bath in Republic. We're like, good luck, right? At that point, knowing what they want and how few listings are in their criteria, we're going to have to set expectations around that contract, right? Okay, just so you know, we don't have a lot of these. So when they come up, they tend to sell fast. We're going to need to be aggressive in our offer and aggressive in our contingency terms. Here's what that means. And then we'll outline those. So number one, in inspections, we have multiple options. We have the property data period, which is the get out of jail free card. I'll tell you right now, if you write me an offer and there's a property data period, you're not getting the house. That's this market. Okay. So that's the first thing. It's a no for us right now. So in my clients, my expectation is that on the listing side, 
For the buy side, I'm telling people, there's a great chance that if you want the get out of jail free card in your contract, it's probably not going to be accepted. Therefore, you can choose whether you want to waive the get out of jail free card, the property data review period, or if you want to keep it. Again, if you keep it, there's a likelihood that your offer will not be accepted when compared to other offers. Or you'll at least get a counter offer, right? Number two, you've got standard inspections. Those are unlimited due diligence inspections, which means you can get an inspection, and if you don't like what's on it for any reason, you can just get, exit the contract. Again, depending on the property right now, I would say that those are probably a little unlikely to be accepted, right? So this first time home buyer example, $180,000 in Republic, it's probably gonna be a very competitive house, probably multiple offers, an unlimited due diligence offer will likely not be accepted or it'll be counter offered, right? So when it's counter offered, it typically gets countered to what we call the limited due diligence or limited inspections. There's a little box. Yeah, limitations of inspections. I forget exactly how it's worded, but it's in bold and in capitals too. And there's a box. When we check that box, that further limits our inspection. So we can do the inspection and with its findings, I can't just walk away. I have to give the seller the opportunity to repair the items that I would want repaired or to compensate me the way I would want to be compensated, right? Now, here's what's fun with that. I mean, technically, I could just ask for the moon <laughs> and then the seller says, no, we're out of the contract anyway, right? Now, what I typically do if my client is dead set on the home, okay, fantastic, we'll limit our inspections and we need to limit our request inside of them. So I typically counsel people, we're looking for major things in these inspections when we're in multiple offer situation or when we're on a really hot property, like a first time home buyer in Republic. We're gonna limit the number of requests that we put in to items that are of concern. Safety, mechanical defect, large ticket items, right? A little bit of peeling paint or whatever, you know, a door handle that's loose, probably not asking for that. But if we've got a hot water heater that won't heat up, that's probably going to be something we're looking for, right? So we're going to future pace them in our expectations around that house at the console. I spend more time on the inspections than any other contingency, right? Financing, everyone kind of understands financing. If a buyer can't be financed, you don't have a deal. Pretty straightforward, right? Appraisal, if it appraises short, we can either renegotiate or walk away. Pretty straightforward, right? It's the inspection contingency that we need to spend the most time on in our consults, right? I guarantee you will shore up, meaning you'll have less fall through on your contracts if you become excellent in the inspection contingency. And that's not by knowing every little piece of the house, it's by understanding what that contingency is and utilizing it in a manner in your consults that allows, you, allows your buyer to be educated in that process. And really the best way to do it is to read your contract and understand the contingencies, right? Really understand it that way you can explain it. Any questions on the inspection contingency? Okay, cool. Please don't hesitate to ask. I know it's like an awkwardly quiet room because you guys all spread out and you're not all close, but it's okay. Seven, set up-to-date market expectations. How many of you guys use market stats in your consults? Okay, one or two? I don't, I don't know why, I just never have. I tend to talk about it, but it would be a fantastic thing to come out and pull this right here. That's the supply and demand. This would be fantastic. Even just like literally this single one, Mike Brown gives this to us, right? Rachel can print it off at any time. It's straight out of broker metrics. It's just the MLS stats. Let me read this to you guys. July 20, no, 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 hold on. May of 22, okay? There were 0.8 months of supply of inventory. So what that means is if not a single house got listed, it would take 0.8 months or what would that be? Roughly, I don't know, like 21 days or something to sell every single house on the MLS with current buyer demand. That's insane, okay? So that was the market that we came from. Today, well, December 22, months of supply inventory, 2.4. Okay, so we've, what, tripled our inventory? Is that triple? Yeah, it's triple. We've tripled our inventory. So my conversation with point eight is, hey, if you even remotely like it, cash as is, no inspections, do whatever you have to do to buy this house. Now we're triple that inventory. Now we're saying, okay, we can actually preserve our contingencies, right? We can have an inspection. I can't still be crazy with my requests because they'll drop it and go resell it to the next person, right? However, 
I actually have the ability to utilize contingencies again and different financing types. This morning, I sold a house with have the listing, buyer's an FHA buyer. I haven't sold an FHA buyer in a long time. Those are first offer came in, it's a great offer, FHA. My seller's like, no problem, we'll make the little repairs if you need to. Heck yeah, we're back, right? But that's the function of the market statistics. So you can actually utilize them if you'd like to you, with your client by giving them the market expectation. Hey, the market is the reason that we have to forego these things or the multiple offer situation or whatever it is. Or on the flip side, hey, the market's slow, therefore we can utilize these contingencies. So have the expectation that you can hire a full-on inspector to go through everything. You probably saw, Josh, you remember roughly, like you had ballpark what percentage of our contracts last year were as is? No inspection. Including or not including our investors? I'd say including, right? Because now investors are doing inspections again. Yeah. Like 15 or 20% of every transaction we did last year out of 515 didn't have an inspection. That's nuts. Like, that's crazy. That's the market of last year. Now, this year, every single deal we've done, I haven't done a single as is yet. Every single deal, one. Okay. So out of 37, we've had one. I mean, that's big change. So market stats can really set the expectations with your buyers. If you guys want market stats, again, reach out to Mike Brown, Rachel Lusk. They can literally just print things off for you. Come to team meetings because they typically go over them at team meetings as well. So if you can zoom in or watch it, you can even fast forward on it to the point where they're talking about current listing inventory. When Mike Brown goes over it, it's always fantastic. So highly encourage that. Any questions on utilizing market stats? Cool. Set expectations seamlessly with your KW Tech. All right. Three steps to gaining referrals. <laughs> We've gone through the expectation setting process. I'm not going to walk you through this because, frankly, I have no freaking clue how it works. So um, utilize it. Okay. <laughs> All right. We're going to get on to three steps to gaining referrals. Before we do, We've just talked about all kinds of different areas in which we set expectations. There's a lot of blanks on your pages that I probably skimmed over as I was riffing through all of them. Out of those blanks, do you have any questions? Do you have any things you'd like clarity on? And then in addition, I, if a real estate transaction has gone bad, I've probably been a part of it already. So if you have any questions on that, now would be a great time to do so. We're going to give ourselves three minutes for any questions and answer. Then we're going to take a short break to use the bathroom, that kind of thing. Anything? Shoot. Done it all wrong. It's okay. I'm going to sit here in silence for three minutes. <laughs> I'm really good at this. We're actually going to set a timer right now. This is going to get so awkward, you guys. It doesn't have to be. You're making it. It doesn't even have to be expectations related, I guess. Anything real estate? This is really going to happen. Plus, what do you do if you tell your client something that you realize is incorrect? Oh, great question, Josh. Thanks for asking. So, number one, own it, right? I have done this a million times. I've given them a fact about a house or a process or something, and it was incorrect, and it comes up as an issue. Own it. I am so sorry. I told you this wrong. This is actually what it is, right? The other side is if they ask you a question and you actually don't know, don't just say something. Just say, I don't know. I don't know. I will find out for you, right? Like that's the difference between knowing everything, like the specialist that we talked about, and the professional. The professional doesn't have every answer. My CPA doesn't have every answer to every question, but he'll say, I don't know, I'll get back to you, right? So that would be number one. Is if I tell something wrong and it affects a transaction, I'm going to own it. I'm going to do what I can to make it right. Sometimes that means I've had to eat it on commission, okay? We've bought a lot of refrigerators, a lot of refrigerators in our years, right? Because it's sitting there in the house, you write the offer, you don't even think to write the refrigerator on the included line. All of a sudden you go to closing, or your final walkthrough, there's no fridge, and you realize you left it off the contract, right? Bought a lot of refrigerators. So number one, we own it. Number two, we do what we can to make it right. If there's nothing that we can do to make it right, at that point, it's a really hard conversation. It's just sometimes a sticky one. You might lose the client. 
And that's okay. Just so you know, there's always another client. But learning through those processes and owning it is going to be a thousand times better for you in your career than blame shifting. You mentioned the refrigerator because we have screwed that up. I started doing this while I was like in the house with a client, refrigerator shed, shelving in the garage or whatever. Text each other while you're sitting there looking at it. So it's in writing. Mm -hmm. You get excited when they're like, let's go write an offer. And you bounce from the house. In the five minutes it takes you to drive back to the office, you don't remember anything they just told you, especially as it's like your first few contracts, you're like super pumped up and your adrenaline's running so high. Mm -hmm. Just text each other. It may be awkward that you just sent them the exact conversation you had, but set the expectation that you're going to do it and they're okay with it. It's fantastic. And it cover your butt. Yeah. I always bring, even like, so today I was showing at 3.30, it's a house I've already been through. I'm still going to bring a notepad and write down any questions the client has. Anything I don't know, refrigerator, shelving, shed, you know, is there a water softener, septic tank, whatever it is, right? So we're still going to do that. That's absolutely, that's great advice. All right, friends, um, recoup at 105, 105. Um, and I'm showing at 3.30. Um, well, no, I will a little bit early. I'm going to meet Sarah so I can pick up Asher. So I was just asking to make sure. Before I'm trying to work as long as I can because my wife has ladies night tonight. I'm leaving at like, I say early, I'm leaving at like three. So not like I'm leaving now. Boy. Third is the 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 third I got one for you guys. This is kind of funny. So we have a self-storage facility and we're moving away from checks, you know, like people like literally writing in checks and like driving it to you, to, like hand it to you. So the property manager has to meet them at the facility and like receive the check. So it's an inconvenient thing ever. So we're transitioning away from checks and cash and moving to like just credit and debit. All of our competitors have done it. So my property manager just texts me and says, what do you tell someone that says they don't want anyone to have access to their bank account but they write you a check every month that has their account number and routing number on it. <laughs> I said, I think you just tell them that. <laughs> it's a hard one. <laughs> Our issues tend to be a little bit more serious than that. All right, friends, we ready to keep going? Everyone's back. Three steps to gaining referrals. This is pretty straightforward. Provide value, ask for help, and then reward. 
Okay. So at this point in our process, right? This um, this concept. Okay. Okay. Let me let me back up. In Ignite, you're constantly being taught, you know, how to gain clients, how to gain clients, how to gain clients, how to transition a customer to a client, lead generation, lead follow up. Like you guys are like, you've got all of that. The number one source of business for every real estate agent I've ever met is their own sphere of influence, aka the people you already know, and then also the people that those people already know. Okay. So our team is roughly 85% referral or repeat business, a so sphere of influence, and then the people that they refer to us. And so I'm not saying we're excellent at it. We just do this at a very basic level pretty well. So number one is we provide value. This is how we are going to number, like we're going to solidify the real estate agent for life. Okay. It's providing value to a client. So for instance, if Emily was working with me, my job is to get Emily what she wants. And to do it in a way where she feels that working with me was worth it. Okay. So whether we, everyone understands it or not, a buyer's agent is actually paying the buyer's agent commission. Okay. They're doing it through paying more for a home. Right. So when I go on a listing appointment, I comp a house to 250,000. That's assuming there's a 6% commission in there. Right. If there wasn't a buyer's agent, potentially that could be a 3% commission. So the idea is every buyer is going to buy a home and out of those sale proceeds, it comes back and pays the agents. Hence this big lawsuit that just got thrown out, by the way. It's kind of cool. However, we want to make sure that in our processes, we are truly doing what that client wants, whether that's selling a house, buying a house, whatever. Number two, we'll never get help if we don't ask for help. Okay, and this is the humbling process. Okay, the humbling process. I don't know about you guys, but it's hard for me, period, in all things, to ask for assistance. So I told you guys I moved not long ago. I did everything myself until I physically couldn't pick something up and my wife wasn't strong enough to do it either. And then I called a friend. Kevin came over, we moved three pieces of furniture, and that was all I asked of him, right? I even pulled all the carpets myself. I, did all. I was like, I am not going to ask for help. So for me, this is the most humbling step is to say, Mr. Buyer, Mr. Seller, Mrs. Buyer, Mrs. Seller, I desperately need your help to continue to grow my real estate business. And while this sounds silly, what I'm asking of you is if you're really enjoying the value that I'm providing would you mind thinking of someone who might need my services? Or when you do hear that someone needs real estate services, would you mind referring me? Say, yeah, I'm sure. Or you can do the old school version of like, hey, you know anyone else who needs a real estate agent? Guess what? That works, right? It's actually not how you ask for help. It's that you ask for help, right? We've all responded to ads of various kinds. Assumed clothes, bait and switch closings, Whatever you want to do, marketing gets us every time. All Amazon has to do for me right now is send me something really cool cigar related. And then I'm like, I got to buy it, right? So asking for help is actually a very easy process. It's you actually soliciting, asking for a referral. The hardest part is our ego in this process. Hi, my name's Wes. I'm a real estate agent. 85% of my business comes from having to do this. Right. So when we get in these transactions or we sign clients, really at any point, we ask three different uh, three different parts in our transaction process. We ask for reviews and referrals. Uh, reviews, I think we're actually up to six times we ask for a review. We ask for referrals three times. The first one is when we sign them as a client. The second one is when they go under contract. And the third time we ask is once they close. And it's the exact same thing. You know, hey, Joe, thanks so much for buying this property with me. I've had a great experience working with you so far. Do you happen to know anyone else who might need my real estate services? No, no problem. Thanks for thinking about it. Right? That's it. Period. No, no problem. Thanks for thinking about it. You know, I don't dig third level on that. But here's what I will do. When someone does finally send me someone, I'm going to reward them. And what do you reward them with typically? In my circles, it tends to be like bourbon. You know, like middle-aged man, you know what I mean? It's like bourbon or like, it's not, not anything cute. Tawny on our team is like a gift basket. Like, it's like, you know, all artsy and cute. Like, I mean, you've seen this crap. 
Yeah. So what we got to do is three pieces. Number one, we nail this, which is the stuff we've been talking about. Number two is we humble ourselves enough to realize that our businesses only grow upon the people that we know and like. You can't buy your enough leads to run a big real estate business. You just can't. Like you can't outspend your own SOI. The other side of it is your SOI will only grow to the, to the size that you grow. What I mean by that is if I have one group of friends and let's say there's eight of them, right? And those are like my main eight people. I mean, not best friends, but I just tend to run in circles with those eight. Those eight probably have another eight, right? And that is likely who I'm majority limited to in terms of my real estate services. If I can go from eight to 200 people in my first level circles, imagine how many more I can get in my second level circles. So what we tend to teach on our team is number one, find a hobby that you absolutely love. So I like playing golf. And so I golf, right? Um, Kevin, our team, he's a golfer too. He's way better golfer than me. So he's, his is golf. Josh is kayaking. Uh, kayak fishing tournaments, very specific niche. He owns it though. He sponsors the tournaments he's in. He's closed probably four and a half million over the last two years, specifically out of the kayak fishermen, right? Tawny's is Republic Missouri welcome homepage Facebook group or some crap like that. I don't even know. She pulls deal after deal out of this Facebook community that she runs, right? We can kind of go on page is her gym, right? Springfield, uh, Springfield, uh, was SFC. We sold them a building. I should know this. Okay. Um, but she uses her gym. So the community that she works out with, she spends inordinate amounts of time there connecting with people and talking, right? So whatever your group is, whether it's, this sounds crazy, but Hunter on our team is fantastic at Call of Duty, plays probably way too much Call of Duty, but the guys he tries to play with are local people. So that's kind of his community. Right? They'll know what he does. So when he does get a lead, it's typically through his own community. So whatever your niche or community is, identify it and go all in on it, specifically for real estate. So everyone at Highland Springs knows I am a real estate agent, not because I have to go out and tell them, but because we'll sponsor things out there or we'll hold events there. We'll bring clients there. We have a presence for Josh's kayak deal. He actually sponsors the entire tournament, $1,800. And he's sold $4 million in real estate out of it. Like that's a trade I'd make any day. And he gets to fish all the time. That's why he's over here. He's like, I'm not going to the awards banquet in March. I'm like, oh, why is that? He's like, because I'll be fishing in Alabama. And I'm like, I hate you. You're going to go to like one of the best bass fishing lakes in the country. And like, you're probably going to get business out of it. Like so dumb, right? Whatever it is, find that niche, go deep into that community. And then go to your next, and to your next, and to your next, okay? So it might not be hobby. It might be church, okay? It might be, I don't know what. What other communities are there? School, PTA moms. Oh, man. I got in. So my sister's a teacher in Ozark. I got in with the teachers in Ozark Elementary, and I probably cleaned up like eight houses in a year through there. It was just one after another, buy, sell, buy, sell, buy, sell of teachers at Ozark North Elementary, right? These niche communities actually have more trust built into them than you could ever imagine. So when you sell one, and I've identified that Emily was just a dog, crazy dog lover, right? I don't know if you actually are. I don't think you are, but we'll say you yeah, are. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. So she's not, but let's say she's absolutely obsessed with dogs. I provided her great value. I asked her for help. Who do you think she's most likely to refer to me? friend, family, community member, right? Okay, now let's say I get any referral. What should my reward be based on? The community that she's in, right? I should be aware enough of my clients to know what they have a passion for. And guess what? Facebook helps a ton with this, right? You can see what pages they've liked. You can see what they post. If they have kids, kids can be a huge one. Young families. I mean, shoot, if someone gave me a gift card, to uh, what's the place where they watch your kids for you? It's right behind uh, Char. Anyway, you literally just drop your kids up there and leave. It's the best thing ever, by the way. And they're wonderful staff nurses, super clean. The basketball coach from Missouri State owns the whole place. It's awesome. Anyway, fun fact, young family, give them a gift card there. The kids love it. There's TVs, playgrounds, ball. Like, it's just crazy, right? But if you're rewarding appropriately based on the referral that was given to you, awesome. Here's my tip on rewarding referrals. 
only reward the referral, not the result, okay? Too many people will only spend the reward, the thank you money on the closed referral and not the actual referral, okay? So this is huge. I will reward anyone who gives me a name and phone number or anyone that says, hey, you know, you sold a house to Joe, Joe's my buddy. I wanna do business with you, he liked you. I'm going and rewarding Joe, okay? I sell to a lot of bankers. Banker seems to be a weird niche I have. I'll take it, I don't really care, I love it. Those guys, they drink like fish and they hardly ever work. So I just play on those two things. I have probably given a hundred bottles of bourbon out to legacy bank bankers in the past four years. Like, I'm not kidding you. Like there was at one point where I bought an entire case of Buffalo Trace and I walked into that office and was handing guys bottles of bourbon. And it sounds crazy, but they loved it. And two of them had given me referrals. And I would tell them like, I was like, oh yeah, Dustin just gave me a referral. So you know, rewarding all you guys. It makes Dustin look like a hero, right? It's so simple and it's so much fun. But it doesn't have to be bankers. It can be whatever the community you're in. It doesn't have to be bourbon. It can be whatever small, meaningful gift you want to give, okay? Again, reward the activity, not the closing though. Spent way too much time on that, but you will make a lot of money if you get that right. Okay. Any questions? Okay. So we asked for referrals at least three times right? Uh, during the transaction. Outside of the transaction, I'm asking for a referral once a quarter from my people. And it's pretty straightforward. Hey, Cody, haven't talked to you in a while. You know, how's life? Oh, it's great. We just had another kid. No way. Congratulations. That's wonderful. Are you guys still liking the house? Now that you have another kid, you probably need a new one, right? And I always do stupid assumed closes like that because people tend to laugh at me because that's what they do. That's my personality and relationship. Utilize your own scripting for your own relationships with these people. Regardless if he says yes or no, I'm still going to finish the conversation with, hey, it's been so great catching up with you. Let me know if you or anyone else you know needs to buy or sell. Like, it's just the sign off. Like people are just used to it. You know, seven years of contacting people once a quarter, sometimes even once a month. Right? They're used to hearing my voice saying, hey, if you or anyone you know needs real estate, let me know. Again, be genuine in it all. Reviews were asking six times during the transaction. Excuse me. Um, let me ask you guys this. Out of all the platforms where someone can leave a real estate agent a review, in your opinions, what do you think the most powerful are? Google. Google. What else? I, I should rephrase the question. What platforms are there? We got Google. Mm -hmm. What else? Yeah. Zillow. Yep. Yelp. Yelp. Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah, so those are kind of the big four. That's fantastic. Um, number one, if you're not advertising on Zillow buying leads, your Zillow reviews kind of don't matter that much. I mean, they kind of do, but like they're search, they don't have like any sort of like search engine optimization unless you're paying for leads. Does that make sense? So if you're buying leads through Zillow, at that point, your Zillow reviews matter. If you're not buying leads through Zillow, you're not getting leads from Zillow anyway. So your reviews don't really matter. I would encourage you to have at least two or three on there throughout your career just to like give you credibility. But Zillow, you can actually upload your transactions to them. Don't tell them what it sold for because we're a non-disclosure state. But you can actually upload your transactions. will give you credibility on there without having to have 50,000 reviews. If you're buying leads, then it matters, right? Because when someone clicks on find a local agent, it'll pull who it is up. It'll have the star rating and the number of reviews. So at that point, it matters because they're going to click on something. Right. But if you're not buying the lead, you're not even going to be on that list anyway. So who cares? Okay. Uh, Facebook. Facebook's a fantastic spot. There's no more five star reviews. It's just do you recommend them or not? Right. There's not really a star rating on Facebook anymore. So I love Facebook recommendations. I also hate them if they're bad because they're like damn near impossible to like change. At least Google, they'll have a review process on it. Right. So you can submit one if it's questionable. If it's like a random like. You don't even know the person. They leave you a one-star review for no reason, right? Which that happens all the time. You, you can actually go in and report it and they'll be like, okay, and they'll remove that review for you. Facebook won't. It's just there. Someone can go up and be like, Wes Litton sucks. That's their entire review. And it's just there. I can petition it and change it, but they have to, they're going to ask why. And I'm going to say, well, I don't suck. You know, and they're like, sorry. Whereas Google will actually track it and say, okay, we can remove the review if you like. Um, the, uh, the last one, Yelp, is very specific. So here's what I found with Yelp. 
Yelp tends to be restaurants, right, in our area. Like that's the, the vast majority. But if you specialize in a review like Yelp or Angie's List is another one, um, there's a couple other platforms that are a little bit more like nuanced in their review ratings. If you can get really high up on those, you will win a lot of business from people that use those services a lot, right? So in our area, I tend to focus on Google. We run a team format. The reason we focus on Google is because the reviews there actually help your kind of general SEO and, and population. So if someone, someone were to type in, you know, um, real estate agent, Springfield, Missouri, and I've got a thousand five-star reviews, which I don't, but let's say we had a five, thousand five-star reviews. I would likely show up before the person that had 20, right? So Google actually tends to utilize their rating system to, to appear in search results. So that's a big one there. The other side is Google right now is the number one source of real estate leads. I don't know if you guys know that, but Google produces more real estate leads than any other platform. And we use these layers over the top of Google's programming like Commissions Inc., Ylopo, um, Boomtown, Rivity, all those CRMs, even KW Command now sits on top of Google's platform. So if you've linked your business account with your website, all of a sudden your Google My Business account where you're collecting your reviews matters, right? Because you're actually going to appear higher on the search results because they're linking your website spending with your My Business Google profile. So you can reduce the cost of leads and actually get more leads the more five-star reviews you have, okay? So kind of crazy, and there's a lot kind of complicated there. I learned all of that like last year, so don't think you have to figure all this out. The reason I'm asking for five-star reviews is actually not any of that. It's so that I can copy it and post it on my Facebook publicly, not in the recommendation side, but literally make a Facebook post of the review, okay? Why? Credibility. We talked about that earlier in our communication, right? Communication is not just verbal one-to-one. -one. It is also what you post on your social media. You should have a version of a game plan or a marketing plan for your social media. And it can be stupid simple. Here's the hot listing of the week link. Here's my favorite dog place in town link. Like it, it can be so simple. You're looking to build credibility inside your business and your personal Facebook pages. Utilizing five-star reviews is in, an incredible way of doing it, right? I think the best in the business at doing it is Adam Grady's team. You'll see client testimonials posted with people's faces and they blow it up. And man, it reaches so many people and it establishes so much credibility. Even if they only got like five reviews a year, you know you would see all five reviews because of the way they take them, they make them pretty, and they publish them on their Facebook page, right? Okay, any questions on reviews? When we ask for them, we tend to ask for them via email throughout the process. Congratulations, you're under contract. We hope this process was smooth and easy for you. Would you mind leaving us a review? And there's a direct link where they can click once, it'll take them right to the Google page or right to the Facebook page, right? Or Zillow or whatever platform you want to use. Here's what I would say. If you have absolutely butchered it, don't send them a review link. Like, if you know you've just dropped the ball and like you've just kind of sucked, like just don't send them a review link. Like, it's okay, right? If you've built a system where it's automated, just keep in mind you need to go in there and like pull that link out of there and be like, oh no, Sally, don't leave me that review. I know I suck, right? Just don't even ask. The typical time when people are gonna leave you a review is actually at closing. That's our sixth request, okay? So the first five throughout the process are actually just leading us up to once they're closed, okay? We've asked, we've asked, we've asked typically via email or text message, and then at closing, there's one final ask, hey, would you mind leaving us a review? Congratulations, you're closed. Would you mind leaving us a review? Then we, at the, at the closing table, we have the agent require or request, hey, I noticed you guys haven't left us a review. Would you mind doing that? You'll probably get an email in a day or two, right? We send them all their closing documents in a PDF and a review link. And that tends to be where we capture the majority of our reviews. Any questions there? Cool. Um, I believe in command too, through opportunities, you can now build email templates as you move your tile through opportunities. Uh, and so one of those you can do is you can actually build in your review requests as you move your opportunity tile 
it can trigger an email just to get dropped and sent. And so uh, utilizing that can really make your review request process easy. We also always tag on there like, hey, we want your review. Also, if you know anyone who wants to buy sell real estate, close. Pretty straightforward. The more people hear it, the more they just think of it. That's it. It's just top of mind stuff. Nothing crazy. And we're never pushy about it. Okay. That's the number one thing I think, particularly like uh, in my experience, like 40 years old and younger, they're used to crap being thrown in their face all the time on social media, sales, nonstop ads. Like we are used to being cold called. Like that's just part of our existence is it was just a ton of ads our way. Right. And frankly, a lot of us click on them and buy that crap because we're stupid. Okay. I'll own that. I look at my father and he's like, why the hell is this guy calling me? Like, there's no way I'm answering that phone. Now, my dad's also 70, so it's a little different. But, you know, there's generational differences with the way people like to be communicated with. There's also individual differences. So what we try to do is we try to hit bands of people by asking multiple ways, right? So whether that's text, email, social media, whatever it is, we try to hit those different bands. So if you can build in reminders or build in automations inside of your marketing programs or your transaction management software, it will just make your life so much easier. If you have questions about that, Nicole Migliazzo can help you do it. She's our new tech ambassador or something like that. So, all right, I'm moving on. Here's a, here's a great script for it. You guys should have that. Okay, sell reviews, buy reviews, talked about that. Uh-huh, we're moving on, okay. Holy crap, that's only the first segment. Man, this is really too long. Okay. This is fun. Okay. What do buyers want most from their agents? Help purchasing the right house. <laughs> it's so dumb. It seems so obvious, guys. And that's the one thing you're going to continue to find in real estate is that it is way, way more obvious than we make it. In all of our trainings, we're going to tend to complicate things because people like me who have been doing it for seven years and building systems for seven years have, you know, a lot to say about it. But the reality is, is like the thing a buyer wants most is that you find them the right house to purchase. Okay. So number one, we're going to find them the right house. Number two, that 24% is other. Okay. Inside of other, we have help with paperwork, determine what comparable homes sell for, and determine how much the buyer can actually afford. Guys, the reality of buyer's agency is it is way simpler than we expect it to be, and we tend to complicate it, right? I would say like broad strokes, that's our entire industry, specifically Keller Williams that comes at it from an educational standpoint. You can be educated to death and feel like you have to do everything perfect to move forward. The reality is the best agents in the world just help people find the right home to purchase. They're focusing on the large blocks of the transaction or of the, the client's needs, right? They want that biggest block. And they know if they can accomplish the biggest block, they have a 52% chance of winning with that client, right? Now, the rest of it tends to come as a result, helping them negotiate the terms of the sale, helping with the price negotiations, the comp, the paperwork, and then, of course, the financing. Here's the needs analysis. I want you guys to dog, dog ear this. They have them in command as well. Um, so if you'd like to, you, do you guys have this in your book? No. Oh, no. Oh, man. Okay, this is actually a really good one. Um, you guys can take a picture of this. The slideshow, uh, it is available to you guys as well in command if you'd like it. Um, this is some of the questions that we were talking about. Rip this off, throw it into a PDF or a Word document, keep adding to it. There's some really good ones in here. Um, number one, we have to be extremely careful that the questions we ask do not go um, into, you know, race, religion, sexual orientation, those kinds of things. The protected classes need to remain protected classes. Our questioning of them inside of our consultations can't have anything to do with that. Okay. So the first, like the fastest way to lose a real estate license is to, uh, you know, unprotect or protect the class. I don't know how everyone wants to say that. Uh, do something that could be interpreted as discrimination against a protective class. And that can literally be as simple as asking the wrong question. So just keep that in mind in your processes. It's also in our property data period. The one reason that people might utilize the property data period is questions like crime. Um, I've had like the sex offender thing come up a lot. That's something that I can't say anything about as a real estate agent. I have to push them to 
websites where they can do the research themselves to make the determination as to whether they want to live there or not. They're not necessarily protected classes, but it's something that I can't do, right? It's called redlining. So, or it's called, um, oh, Josh would know this. Josh likes to make fun of people for doing this when they're not doing it. Oh, I forget. It's not inducement. It's when you're trying to push people steering. There it is. You're steering people to a certain house or a certain neighborhood. You can't do any of that kind of thing. We can ask them questions based on their preferences. We can show those locations. Outside of that, we have to refer to different resources for them. Uh, even if you know the answer, even if they ask you something that's questionable and you know the answer, you still need to push them toward resources. Okay. All right. Okay. Buyers' lives change or buyers', buyers world changes. So when you have your buyer consultation, there's really only two things when you go from the needs analysis, all the questions they answer, there's two things that happen to people. Number one, their life changes. So what would that kind of look like? Maybe they got pregnant. Maybe they didn't get the job. Maybe whatever it is. Oh, you pick. Their buyer's lives change or the buyer's world changes. What tends to happen over here in lives changing is their needs change. Their desires for the home changes. World changes tend to take them out of the market. Okay? Does that make sense? So whenever we're talking to clients and we're interpreting what's going on in their lives, we're asking the question, is this a life change event that's going to require that they need a different product or a different home? Or is this a world change event? And I need to be sensitive to the fact that their timing might change, right? Or they might never buy, right? We're going to keep those things in mind. Tough conversations equal fiduciary conversations. Earlier, we talked about fiduciary as working for the client. Sometimes our clients don't exactly know the process very well, and it puts us in a hard position around the contract. So to give you one example, earlier we talked about limiting our inspections. For us, it makes sense. We've done it a million times. We read the contract. We interpret the contract. We know the contract. However, our client doesn't. So when I say, all right, Mr. Buyer, Mrs. Buyer, are you willing to limit your inspections to purchase this home? We've already talked about it in the console, right? But I asked them that question. They say, yes, I check the box and move on, we sign. Then inspection time, two weeks later, from that comes along and we get the inspection back and it's terrible. And they're like, we just went out of the contract. Like, we you can't yet, right? And they're immediately going to go, why not? You told me if we got an inspection, we didn't like it, we'd get out of the contract. I say, yeah, that's not exactly true, right? That's one of the many examples of going into tough conversations. And I'll be honest with you, I don't enjoy that conversation, which is why I spend an inordinate amount of time in my consultation around inspections. But in this context, we still have to do what's right for them. We can't just recommend someone just break a contract, break, break a contract, right? Not only will it ruin your reputation as an agent, but it puts them open to, to uh, litigation, right? So as a fiduciary, my job is to get them what they want and make sure they do it in a way that's legal. Sometimes what they want is out of a contract and that's okay. It's gonna take some communication, some tough conversations. So in that context, my first call is typically to the seller, seller's agent, excuse me. Uh, Hi, Mr. or Mrs. Listing Agent. I'm so sorry, my buyer is no longer off the house based on the inspection findings. There are two options. I can send you a mutual release, so it'll just be done. I won't send you the inspection, so you don't have to update your disclosures. Or number two, uh, we're gonna ask for basically a lot um, to the point where it'd probably be prohibitive for your seller to do the repairs. Here's the deal though. I did this to Adam Grady years ago. Oh, this is a fun story. Oh man, I had, I'll never forget it. I'll never forget it. So remember earlier when I said the buyer's agency agreement thing, like if you don't sign them, they could go use another agent. That's what happened here. These people were looking at homes with Kasha Driscoll. Um, I didn't know that. They get referred to me by their lender, right? So they went to their lender. The lender's like, oh, I work with West. You should work with West. So then I go meet them, have a full concert. They never once mentioned cons. Kasha, we signed the exclusive agency agreement. So in my mind, I'm like, sweet, I just signed a pre-approved buyer with a great lender, like 300,000 price point. This was like four years ago. So I'm like, that's a lot of money. You know, we're rocking and rolling. Well, we get under contract. This house has easily 150 page inspection report come back. And I'm like, oh no, here we go. And these people were like, we want help. And I'm like, I don't blame you. 
And so I call Adam, I'm like, hey man, these people don't want out. He's like, hey, your contract says you're gonna send me an inspection notice. I said, I can do that. I'm like, it's gonna be huge. Like it's a 150 page report, it's gonna be huge. And he's like, send it. And that's when you know you're dealing with a badass, right? I'm like, oh no, here we go. <laughs> it took me four days to type this thing out, get the specialists in there, get the in, like invoices, like everything. This sucker, this inspection notice got the hundred some odd page uh, actual inspection report, active termite report, roof report, structural engineers report. I mean, it's got it all. And it's got three pages of an exhibit with items listed on it. We send it over within an hour, it's signed and returned. They're going to do everything. And my client's like, Wes, you were supposed to get us out of this contract. And I'm like, they're going to do all of it? <laughs> like, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> like, they signed it. Like, they're going to do it. And I swear to God, they got every last thing done and done excellently. And we closed on that house. $39,000 worth of work done to that house. Mm -hmm. Right? I will never, like, that was the number one lesson in my life. And these people closed on it. They were very frustrated. They didn't want to get sued. They were like, all right, we're going to go through with it. They close on it. They lived there for two years, sold it for a hundred grand more, you know, because the market blew up and they're all happy now. But in that moment, I tried to have the tough conversation. Didn't do well with that, right? Therefore, I truly didn't provide that fiduciary customer service that I should have been able to. My consultation up front was not strong enough. It was not tough enough. My conversation in that moment of if they say, yes, you have to buy this house, it wasn't strong enough, right? The clarity and the understanding of the important issues was not there because I was too timid to have those conversations with people who are older than me. As silly as that is, right? Age doesn't matter in this business. What matters is, are you going to be a fiduciary or not, right? So that was a huge lesson because when they say yes and they do it all, you're kind of like, you know, SOL, like you're, you're just... It is what it is. You got to close. So that's where we ended up. Now, come to find out, you know, I think Adam, you know, paid for some of it just to kind of show me, but I haven't been able to confirm that. But he taught me a lesson that day. Let me tell you. All right. We're going to show homes based on this needs analysis. So we've had the needs analysis. We've had hard conversations around these items of the contract and the realities of the market, right? All those expectations that we had talked about earlier. We're now showing homes based on the needs analysis. Here's a few things. Number one, don't show every property, show the best properties, okay? Here's a lot of properties that are sitting on the market right now that are really not worth what they're listed at. Just tell your client that, hey, that house is not worth what it's listed at. I'll show it to you if you're willing to take on the deferred maintenance and we can get it cheaper. Then I'll show it to you, but you gotta be aware this is not worth what it's listed at. Number two, have the actual listing information with you. If it's not on MLS, get information off of CRS tax info, the assessor's website, whatever sites you can, even print out the old Zillow listing if you need to. Bring as much info as you can on it. That way, when they ask you, what's the exact dimensions of this bedroom? Then you're like, I have no clue. It might be on an old listing, right? Or if they say, you know, well, how much square feet is in the basement? You know, you look down 752, 752, perfect, right? That'll help us look like professionals. Number two, mark them on a map and answer locations. Um, I haven't even taught Emily this one yet, but Google Maps has a multi-mapping process. It's free, by the way. You can use Google Maps, you can type in multiple addresses, it'll pinpoint them. You can click your starting address and your ending address, and it'll map route the fastest way through all the properties. It's kind of cool. So then you can set up your showings in that order. So if you have three or four showings, you can pick your starting location and then you can map them based on proximity. So you don't spend you know, a ton of time in the cars. I just sold a package of nine and we went and did all the walkthroughs. We didn't do this. I literally drove through half a tank of gas showing nine properties. They were all within a three mile radius of each other. Like it was just one side to the other over and over and over. One was on the south side and then we had to bounce back up. Like it was insane. Oh, and by the way, divisions closed for road work. So it's a lot of fun. Be knowledgeable about the property in the neighborhood. Do a little bit of research. Um, you know, this town small it's where you'll really get used to like the majority of the area. So you don't have to do a ton of this. Just have some idea about the property. Big ones in our area is for some reason, there are still septic tanks and wells right in the middle of Springfield. I don't know if you guys know this. Ah, this is so stupid. But just make sure that you're at least looking through the big items. You kind of have an idea. Check out the seller disclosure statement if there's one filled out, right? Um, include recent comps. I usually do bring a one-line CMA to most of my showings. If I know they're going to be hot on a property, I'll bring at least a one-line CMA where you have a summary information on each of them. That way I can show them 
one, two, three Main Street sold for this. I know we're at one, three, five Main Street and we're a little bit smaller, but it still kind of justifies the price, you know, make them comfortable there. Uh, potential issues and concerns. Our job as real estate agents is to not be the inspector, but when I go into a house as a leaking roof, I should probably point that out to the buyer. You know, major defects that are obvious, familiarize yourself with some common ones and, and just do your best to point those out. You're not responsible to point out everything. You're just going to do your best to help them make this decision. We're going to rely on the inspector to be the official determiner of what's going on, right? Now, with this last one, the more you're in this business, the more you'll be able to recognize things, right? If you need to, then come to my office. We'll print you out a thousand inspection reports. You can walk through them. You'll learn a lot about houses. You'll learn the difference between a sill plate and a rim joist, which that's a big deal, by the way, when you ask for the wrong one to be repaired. It's fun. I've done that. You know, it's like, those are two different things. I'm like, oh, cool. You know, didn't know. There's plenty of that. So point out what you can. All right. This is a huge one. Can I give you guys like my number one pet peeve of all time as a listing agent? When I list a house and it says vacant lockbox, go show on the showing instructions. And then I get a phone call or a text message saying, can I show that today at three? I'm like, I literally already told you, you can go show it. Like, like it just drives me insane. It's different when someone says, hey, do you have any offers on this property? I'm going to go show it at three. Right. So your agent interactions and your means of communication with them and how you communicate is super important. If I have a, like, for instance, a guy walked in my office this morning, the house literally went pending 30 minutes before he walked into my office. And he was like, I need you to withdraw that contract. I'm going to write you a better one. And he's like standing at my desk. I'm like, no, I, it's already under contract. I can't like withdraw it, you know, but the way it all happened, I was like, oh, I hope I never have to do a deal with that guy. You know, it's the same idea in our communications with people, cordial to the point and be kind of generally understanding. So when someone asks a vacant lockbox to go show and they say, can I show it at three o'clock? Why would the answer be no? I've already told you go show. Unless there's a legitimate reason, then you would include that in your question. If the question is, are there offers? If, if so, do I still have enough time to show at three o'clock before your offer expires, right? You can ask Better educated questions, it's going to get you a better reciprocation from that agent. It will establish your credibility with them as well, right? How we communicate one another with agents is everything. It is everything. I might not be in business with the same clients in 15 years, but there's a great chance that in 15 years, I'm still in business with a lot of you guys in this room, right? And you might look at me and be like, oh, that's crazy. But at the same time, I was sitting exactly where you guys were at seven years ago looking up at Carrie Prater teaching courses like this going, oh my gosh, you're not me and Carrie have done probably 40 deals over the past five years, you know? So it's like your agent to agent interactions are everything. You might not be in business with the same client, but you definitely will be in business with agents for a long time. Okay. Yeah. The only thing I would add is uh, maybe a firearm with a concealed carry permit. Um, other than that, just please be careful. We were in a house the other day with squatters. That was a lot of fun. Um, I don't know if you saw yesterday, Tom Watkins Park, um, the shooting that happened up there. It's literally right across the street from a house we have listed. Like, literally, if I'm the house, um, the back, like, red benches is where the shooting happened. Like, you know, and like, there's, there's a lot that goes on in this town that's scary. We just got ranked the third most dangerous town in the United States, or most violent crimes in the United States. A great place to live. Okay. So just be very aware when you're going to, into houses, particularly vacant this time of year in the cold. That was yesterday. We got to this house, $35,000 house. It was like, this thing needs to be torn down. It was bad. But of course, the first thing we do, we roll up and there's like shoe prints everywhere in the snow. And we're like, someone's here, right? Luckily, I brought someone with me, which is always a great idea. We look in, three homeless guys sleeping in the garage. No problem. Like, I'm not disturbing them. I'm like, hey, you guys do your thing. I'm just leaving, right? It's not always peaceful, so just be, be aware. All right, safety first when showing homes. Yeah, I think we talked about that. Your job is to sell homes, not show homes. Uh, Emily, can you define the difference between those two for us? Um, no. um, it just kind of goes along with pinpointing like the defects and stuff like that because you're working as a fiduciary for your client, making sure that they're safe in their home. Mm -hmm. Um, showing homes, I mean, anyone can show a home. You can go in and be like, this is a great house. Three bad, two bad. Great. Yep. 
Yeah, that's a great point. So if all we're doing is like literally opening doors and like this is a home, you know, such a low value, right? Also, you don't get paid to show homes. I don't know if you guys recognize that. Like you can show a thousand homes and make zero dollars. It's really fun. So what we're going to do over here on the sell home side is utilize that needs analysis. And we're going to be using scripts inside of it. Let me see if we have any scripts in here. Nope. Uh, well, this is kind of scripts. But the scripts that we're utilizing is, you know, Mr. Buyer, Mrs. Seller. Is this home similar? This home matches a lot of the criteria that you expressed interest in. How do you guys feel about this home? Right? Or you can ask some great questions. Are there any things inside this home that make you afraid to commit to purchasing it? Right? If they don't like some minor detail of the home. If we were able to repair that minor detail of the home, would this be something that you'd be interested in purchasing? Because you can always write that in the contract, right? They don't feel like they've seen enough homes. This is my favorite one. You might not have seen enough homes. However, you've seen the best homes, remember? Because that's what we did earlier. We only showed them the best. So they sent us 15, we narrowed it down to four. And we said, we're only gonna show you four, right? You haven't seen enough homes, but you've seen the best, right? And then we go back to their motivation, whatever their motivation was. You needed to be in this home by X, Y, Z date. Well, you're going to need to purchase a home. That means in the next three, five days. So number one, if this is your number one home right now, I cannot guarantee this home will be on the market tomorrow. Okay. So it's that narrowing down their criteria to the scarce number of available homes. Um, they need to sleep on it and or get the opinion of a trusted advisor. I love this one. This is a hard one. Like, I need to sleep on it. Great. Well, let me see if you actually have the time to. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I don't think there's anything wrong with saying, you know, I want to ask my parents if it's a good deal. Great. I trusted my parents when I bought my first home. Did my real estate agent probably love that I asked my mom? No, probably not. She was working with me. However, what I would do on this one is if they need the opinion of a trusted advisor, my next question would be, if they don't like this home, do you mind getting them to come to the showings with us on the next homes? Does that make sense? And then what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to bring them into either potentially a home or our office. We're going to have a new strategy session and that trusted advisor is going to be there as well. And we're going to re-verify their needs analysis, right? That way the trusted advisor can see that I'm asking them questions about motivation and desires and attempting to match it to the home. It's a version of setting expectations with that trusted advisor, parent, whoever, attorney, whatever it is. Need to sleep on it. If they have time, let them sleep on it. What I typically do is what I'll do, if you like the home, but you still like to sleep on it, I'm gonna prepare the contract and offer for us tonight. I'm gonna to send it to you for your signatures. As soon as you wake up, if you're ready to go, sign it. If not, I'm gonna call you at 8 a.m. This morning, I called the guy at 9 a.m. He said, not 8 a.m., 9 a.m. Called him at 9 a.m., he signed the offer, right? Same thing, very simple, no problem sleeping on it. Not many real estate agents do business while they're asleep anyway, right? So if we have the ability to wait, we might as well do it, allow the buyer to do so. All right. If they change their mind, they change their mind. We're going right back to their motivations. We're going back to their needs and wants. Advising them as a consultant and fiduciary. You know, Mr. Buyer, Mr. Seller, you actually wanted this transaction to happen. This is why you told me you wanted it to happen. But this is what we're attempting to do. What's causing you to not want to fulfill your portion of that process? I lay their fears. That's a pretty simple one. You know, whatever they're afraid of, we accept it. We confirm it. And then we, we address it, right? So if someone says, well, I'm afraid I'm going to pay too much. You know what? That's a very common fear in this market. However, blah, blah, blah. We go right into it, right? Whatever that, that problem solver is. Again, solve their challenges. Calculate the cost of waiting. That's a big one. Fed just raised interest rates half a uh, quarter point, And then interest rates went down 0.2%. What? Right? Like, it doesn't make any sense. However, we're also in this market right now that doesn't make a ton of sense. I listed one last night, multiple offers on it today, right? Like, when was the last time that happened, you know? However, we don't really know. So right now, the cost of waiting is actually, what's the cost of waiting with an unknown future, right? Pricing could escalate and probably will escalate. I'm, es I'm estimating in the spring. I think we're going to see more inventory, inventory come on and good properties are going to be priced pretty strongly. I'm pricing pretty, pretty aggressively right now uh, and selling. So I'm looking at, I'm going, Springfield's a unique place. However, we also have the Fed that just rose, raised interest rates. We could have some random event like in 2008 when oil went up, it caused interest rates to rise. It's like, okay, so oil surges to $135 a barrel. 
And all of a sudden, our 2.75 interest rate is now at 3.5. Not a big deal, but back then, there's a 50% increase in the cost. So when you look at it, there's a lot of things that we don't control. And moving into an unknown market, I would be highlighting. I am not going to get through this. We're going to try. What sellers want most from their agent? If you guys have any questions, pull them. I'm not answering them. <laughs> All right. <laughs> help price um, comparatively. Help seller market home to potential buyers. Help sell the home within specific time. Right? Help seller find ways to fix up the home. Sell for more. Okay. Uh, we're going to address this one right here. Help seller market home to potential buyers. Who here does anything different than I do that you know of? If not, and I don't think you would probably do anything different than I do with the home, right? I mean, Facebook posts. We have a wide audience. Maybe we have a wider audience. But ninety-nine percent of the time, the MLS sells the house, not me. I uh, very rarely do deals with you know my own clients, house to house. Maybe another agent on our team will have a buyer for a house, but very rarely do I do close transactions without another real estate agent involved. Um, and I've never sold a house to an unrepresented buyer in seven years. So was that like almost 3,000 houses never sold to an unrepresented buyer? So when you look at it, you go, okay, there's plenty of opportunity without some massive marketing database. No, no need to go spend a bunch of money on someone to like go build your social media huge. List homes, right? Zillow, MLS, Realtor.com. That's the majority of syndication sites out there. Okay. Pricing homes, great. The three things that sellers need, they need a great price. Right now, we've got two issues. We have pricing that is not the same as May. Remember, because we have three times the amount of inventory. We talked about right here with the stat sheet. So when there's more inventory and less demand, pricing tends to adjust to demand, which means it comes down. So right now, pricing is coming down in certain areas. But there's also stuff like a three-bedroom, two-bath, two-car garage in Cambridge Terrace that I listed for 200000 and it got multiple offers. Right, so that one demand is actually really high for it. It's really hard to tell market to market. So your pricing right now, if you're looking at listing a house, I'm pricing based on the last three months of comparable sales, right? And then I'm looking at actives on the market and I'm going, how do I beat that house? Is my house better than it? Great, I beat it. Is my house not as good? Oof, maybe I need to be under. Is it about the same? I need to be under, right? The only reason I would price above a comp is if the house that I'm comping is actually better. Right, more marketable, uh, cuter, um, more space, that kind of thing. Also, if you have a seller, I've got one right now in Ozark. I go in, listing appointment, I'm like 220 maybe. He's like, no way. I'm like, if you paint this thing, I'll list it at 260. And he laughed. And I'm like, I'm telling you, you have comps that are painted all white that have sold for 260. You have comps that look like your current house, not painted, same finishes, not painted at 220. Like, Cute matters. Whether we like it or not, cute matters. Time frame. How soon do you need to sell the house? You know, a lot of sellers have an actual time frame for moving forward, whether that's job relocation, downsizing, whatever it is, they have a desired time frame. Our goal is to meet those needs. Our pricing is going to reflect more than anything in the time frame. Days on market right now is death. Days on market is death. Do everything you can to reduce days on market. Okay. Five listings that are sitting, I am reductions every week, typically like three to $5,000 a week, or we're going two weeks, six to 10,000, right? If I'm not getting 10 showings in 10 days, I'm dropping 10%. That's my line right now with sellers. But don't get 10 showings in 10 days, we drop 10%. People don't like that. If it's a $300,000 house, you're gonna drop it 30 grand. They hate that. But then they drop a 30 grand, they sell it in a heartbeat, and they're happy with you. Ferguson, remember that one? Holy oh, shit, those people. Love them. Love them, but man, they thought that house was everything. And we started doing our reductions $5,000 a weekend until I crested directly under $300,000, right where it should have been priced, and it sold in a heartbeat. We missed their time frame completely. However, they knew it was their fault because I made sure they knew. Conveyances. What goes with the property? Now, that's going to include cute things. It's going to include shed. You know, now a refrigerator matters in a transaction. You know, six months ago, you couldn't get a fridge. Now you can get two if you want them, right? So conveyances also matter. The one that I sold this morning, uh, multiple offers, was fully furnished. It used to be an Airbnb. So literally, they're getting like salt. Like they're getting everything. Salt, pepper, glasses, silverware, beds, you name it. It's like he ain't touching a thing. That is yours. Move right in. And people were all over it. Like all over it. And you know that guy, that's like 10 grand worth of staging is all he did. 
right? It's ten thousand dollars in furniture and like kitchen appliances and like silverware and stuff. And all of a sudden, there's just buyers out of nowhere. So conveyances matter again. Also inside of conveyances, seller concessions. Seller concessions are back. So if you're listing a home, just expect them. If your price range for listing is between 270 and 273, I'm probably picking 272.5 and telling my seller that we need to expect to give seller concessions to a potential buyer, right? It's just back. It's just part of it again, okay? We've already talked about the difference between lives and worlds. Here's what sell, ooh, sellers control price and condition, okay? So the number one seller of a home is neither of these, it's location. Okay, the seller can't control the location. A lot of times your comps are gonna be based on the location. This is where we go back to what does a buyer want? We talk about school districts. We talk about you know, the nuances of the home. Our comps need to reflect that. We can't just do a, you know, a half mile radius for comps because if that half mile radius crests into a different school district, you might have completely different pricing, right? So we're school district specific and then we comp based on you know, neighborhoods and territories you know, inside of that school district. Sounds crazy. It works so much better and it gives you so much more accurate comps. Sellers control the price and condition. If the seller is not willing to change the price and we need an adjustment, we need to change the condition. It's kind of two sides of the coin, right? You either need to give someone something better for the price or you need to reduce the price to match the condition. So like my buddy, who's going to be painting his house. When I say buddy, I don't really know the guy. That guy, he's going to need to paint his house, right? That's condition. That allows us to justify the price. Otherwise, he's going to have to drop price to the level of that condition. Sensitive seller conversations. Okay, um, we've kind of already talked about that. Sensitive seller conversations. Let me give you a couple of these because I think right now people are missing them. Um, so this is this is a fun one. Number one, the market of the moment is huge. Okay, so what people want out of their house matters more than ever for them right now because they've just missed the best market Springfield has ever seen. Okay, it might come back, who knows? But right now they've missed it, we've peaked, we've come down off of the best market Springfield has ever seen in its history. Does it mean it's a bad time to sell? Absolutely not. We're still extremely high in price compared to where we've been historically. So don't get me wrong, we just, we're just like on the, the downside of the slope a little bit, but the peak's already passed us. We have to understand that. Number one, that's sensitive. Your house is not worth the same amount as it was four months ago, six months ago, right? Okay, stinky houses. This is a fun one. <laughs> Have you guys ever met someone, like even a friend or family member, you go to their house and it stinks and you're like, ah, how do I say this? You know, if it's like one of my guy friends, I can just be like, dude, your house stinks. But if I'm trying to win a listing, I can't be like, dude, your house stinks, right? So it's a really sensitive issue. Let me give you a couple scenarios uh, for, okay, let me, I'll give you a few. Uh, smoking, it's another one. People who smoke in their homes, it really limits buyer pools. Pets, pets can limit our buyer pool too. People have allergies to dogs, dog smells, that kind of thing. Um, deferred maintenance, personal colors. I sold a house one time where this is the worst story of all time. I'm totally gonna go over to that. I hope you guys don't kill me. Worst we're, we're story of all time, house 455 Bailiwick. I'll never forget it. Over in Rogersville, amazing house. My first transaction with Jen Davis. I did everything wrong in this transaction. These people were selling because their daughter had just died of cancer. She was 13 years old. Just heart-wrenching sad. Like, I, like, to this day, I'm still, like, kind of torn up about it. Prior to her, her dad was an artist, like a painter, so abstract art, and uh, they were moving back home to Colorado. They had her here for special treatment um, for some thing of rat mercy. I don't really know the details, but the two weeks prior to her death, they went through together, father, daughter, and painted each room a different primary color. The daughter got to pick, okay? So this is what I'm walking into. I have no idea. I have no idea daughter has died. I have no idea daughter had cancer. I had no idea this is how they painted the rooms. First thing out of my mouth, wow, how'd you guys pick the colors? And story. And I'm like, uh, right? So terrible. Then prior to closing, the buyer that was represented by Miss Jen Davis, um, the buyer, unbeknownst to any of us, hires a painter. The painter gains access through the garage. It was cracked. He like slipped under, popped it open, went in the garage and repainted the entire house the week before closing. No one knows this, okay? We did not authorize it, nothing. By the way, this has happened probably five or six times in my career, so heads up. 
my sellers go back to the house for one last visit and the entire house is repainted. That was the worst week of my life. I cried, they cried, Jen cried, the buyer apologized profusely. I mean, the whole thing was a nightmare. That property did not close. The seller refused to sell to them. And at that point, I'm now out of contract. The buyer is stunned because they're like, well, we still want the house, you know? They've already got moving trucks and everything. And I'm left with this conversation around how do we patch this? You know, like you still have to move. <laughs> like you don't have to, you know, you don't have to close anymore, but you need to, right? So it's fun. So sensitive topics, sensitive conversations. They are always worth having upfront, okay? We never want to have them ever. And yet, if you don't, you will find yourself in a 455 bailiwick situation every time, right? What I should have done is even in the uncomfortable situation of the daughter having cancer, that I'm not going to paint, just to remind them that every single buyer is going to do the exact same thing that you did when you bought the house, which was get it repainted. Now, here at the end, when you guys are all repainted with your daughter, that's one thing. However, I should have been tough enough to have the conversation about what a buyer is going to be looking for in a house up front, and we could have avoided all of that, right? That was on me. That was not on the client. Frankly, it wasn't even on the buyer, and it definitely wasn't on Jen Davis. That was on me because I was uncomfortable with the seller conversation. This is also why you see teams split listings and buy sides. So you have listing agents and buyer's agents. Buyer's agents get to have fun conversations. Listing agents get to have shitty conversations. Yeah, so it tends to be a different personality who will hold listening. So I tend to hold listings because I will just shoot it to the quick after learning all the wrong things, right? When I started in real estate, I couldn't do it. And I learned my lessons quick. Cluttered houses. Oh my gosh, this is a big one. Cluttered houses. You just got to tell them, hey, I cannot photograph the house in its current condition. We're going to have to declutter. I can send a professional to help you. Or we can work on this, you know, you can work on this yourself. And a lot of times I'll send a professional out to actually give a quick consultation. You know, here's what it means to declutter. This is what it looks like. Let's depersonalize the homes too. How many of you guys walked into a house that have like an entire wall of every photo of their family? And it is the coolest thing ever until you're putting it all over the internet. And it looks like the walls got chicken pox in the photos. And then you arrive there and literally everyone sees every one of your kids from ages zero to you know, 18. So a gun's in the house. This is another one. I have this. Oh, man, this one came up recently. You know, big NRA guy. Look, not getting political, but there are some people who don't like the NRA. Like, that's just the way it is. And it's Missouri. I, I figured everyone liked the NRA in Missouri. Apparently, it's not the case. Big NRA guy. Guns everywhere. Feedback consistently. Wow, this guy loves the NRA. My buyers are out. Like, three or four levels of feedback. And I'm like, I knew this was going to happen. Why didn't I just say something, you know? Tough seller conversation. Um, one that's sensitive right now, and I'm going there because I'm from Oregon originally, is marijuana, right? So marijuana is in this weird phase of like, it's kind of legal, but not. It's being legalized, but it's not. Here's my recommendation on all things vices, whether it's gambling, alcohol, whatever. All things vices is it does not appear in my listings and it does not appear on my showings. You can have them, Mr. and Mrs. Seller. I don't care, uh, but just not in my show. So I'm going there again. Uh, sex toys. It's a huge one. We run into this all the time. Get that stuff like out of the listing photos. Get it like when showings are happening, just get it out of there. It's not that hard. Like you asked, my, you asked Randy Henderson how many times he has had to crop out explicit material from people's homes and it's shocking and then i'm like oh those are my listings great you know <laughs> so anyway just they're, they're hard conversations i will never forget the guy used to be a vendor here at kw he wanted me to list his house i walk in and his entire master is just covered in like his wife's lingerie and like nude art and all kinds of stuff and it was the most uncomfortable moment of my life as a realtor to have her standing next to me walking into this master with photos of her on the wall and like her, you know, inappropriate clothing in her closet hanging. Like that was uncomfortable. And at the same time, I look at her husband, I'm like, wow. And, you know, walk right out, act like nothing happened. And I pull him aside, I'm like, dude, it's all gotta go. Like, 
you can't be like, you can't have that with people. He's like, but that's, that's art. I'm like, it's kind of just a photograph of your wife, man. Like, <laughs> yeah, you need to like move this on, you know? Like, it sounds so silly, but like, this is actual stuff that'll happen. Hit those head on. If it's an odor and it can't be solved, don't solve it, price it, right? If it can be solved, solve it. Ozone machines, repainting, that kind of thing. Um, again, price can change based on the condition of the property, regardless of the comps. Whew, that was a lot. Okay, great agent communication. This is big. By the way, if you're a great agent and you follow the Y4C2Ts, which you guys go over all the time, and they're wonderful, you know you'll actually end up doing more business. That's what's wild. Like all the KWisms, if you actually live out like they're like this is the belief system right here. If you actually live it out, you'll make way more money and do more deals. Right. Like, especially this first one, looking for win-wins. Cutting commission is not the way to deal. We set a listing appointment this morning. One of our competitors um, is also going on the listing appointment. The seller openly said to us, well, on the phone, they said they would offer a 4% commission. So we're probably going to go with them. Kevin had this call this morning. Kevin's response was, wow, they already cut their commission. Well, what else are they going to cut? Like, this is kind of weird. Then Kevin's like, how are they going to market your home? Like, what money are they going to spend on photos and, you know, ads and that kind of thing? He's like, oh, I guess you're right. If they cut their commission, they not going to have any money. I'm like, yeah, no commission is worth the reputation. Don't be the person that cuts the commission to win the right now business. Now, if you're in a sticky situation, commission comes up and you're trying to close the deal, that's a whole different story. But don't walk into listing appointments going, I'm going to cut 2% just to take your listing. Like, come on, be better than that. I think we're going to win this one at a full commission, right? We do it all the time. We win listing after listing at full commissions. I don't know the last time we took a commission sub 6%. I know this year, not a single one. And I don't think last year we did any. Um, well, there's a few last year, but they were ill-advised, very ill-advised, right? But we never cut up front, period. It just doesn't happen. You'll also see on the MLS, there's a lot of 2.5 buy sides, right? I would advise you, don't be that guy, right? Don't be the 2.5 listing agent. If you're the 2.5 listing agent, immediately everyone hates you. It's like asking what time you're allowed to go show up vacant house. It's like, it's vacant, just go, right? Like, don't be the 2.5 person. It drives me nuts. Your reputation is not worth it. Also, your clients don't care. They think they care. They don't care. It's never about the money. It's always about something else. No one calls a real estate agent and goes, I think I can magically make money, so I'm going to uproot my entire family and move across town. Like, no one does that. They always have some other motivation for moving. It's never about the exact red cent. Now, do they want to make as much as they can? Do they want to save as much as they can? Yes, but it's never, let me cut my weight of value. It doesn't work that way. Okay, Whew. soapbox gone. Working set marketing plan. It's in the MREA, by the way. So MREA is a fantastic resource. There's all kinds of really good stuff in there. This is a good one. Uh, the message you felt to attract prospective buyers and sellers is everything. Why would they want to contact you in this market? What would you get? What would they get if they did? These two questions are at the heart of every of all effective messaging. What I would say is in your listing consultations, you have to at least hit these two things, right? Why, why, why do they want to work with you? Number one. And what are you, what are they going to get if they do? Okay. When I was an individual agent, I would say, I, I cannot express enough how important it is that you work with an individual agent. You'll have direct access to me. Not only will you have my personal cell phone number, but I will be the one working your paperwork and your process from start to finish, right? Now that I'm a team, I say, why would you want to work with an individual agent, <laughs> right? When you work with me, you get me focused entirely on the most important aspects of your transaction and someone else can handle the paperwork where that's their specialty, right? What your value proposition and messaging is just going to be catered to what you actually provide, right? So we're not intent, like I, I say that jokingly, I wasn't actually out there bad mouthing teams. I don't now actually bad mouth individual agents. I think the biggest opportunity in the market is either number one, a lean mean team or number two, an individual agent, right? Low cost transact or low cost business. It's everything right now. But what would they get if they did? Why well, choose you or me? You're like, I don't know. And I'm kind of like, I don't know either. I just want you to, right? So I have to put together my own value proposition as to why they would choose me. Okay, Shanna, we are not even close. I am so sorry. I'm, I think they love it. I feel like when I walked in, yeah, they're the all silence and never asking them. questions really gives it away. <laughs> this group, man. Woo. All right, really, a lot of people, people in here. All right, your MLS listing reflects your brand. Oh, dear Lord, thank God for this one. Okay, 
When you list a home, however that listing appears across all marketing platforms, including the MLS, is actually you, right? It's kind of a mirror image of your standard. So for instance, on my team, if someone's gonna put up a listing, number one, there has to be professional photos. If there's not professional photos, it better be like a burn down. Like it's gotta be like a bad house. We don't want professional photos. Like we don't really want them to see. But if you're gonna list with me, you have to have professional photos. There has to be a professional marketing package put together. If there's not, we won't list it. In fact, in our agency agreements, in the special agreement section or the other provisions, we actually write listing to be held off of the MLS until professional marketing package is complete, right? Because we all know if we sign a listing, we have to put it on like four days or whatever. So we put that directly in there and the seller signs it, right? So they know I'm holding it off until that thing's done. The documents have to be in there. We know seller disclosures, lead-based paint. If you have the CCNRs, they need to be uploaded. And then on the listing details, our assistants or our listing managers will put those together. Then they send them to the agent and the agent has to confirm them. If there's issues in those listing details, they have to be fixed. My standard is really not that high. My standard is accuracy, right? Like if you meet me and we become friends, you'll find that like I am just, I will just shoot you straight 100% of the time. I will laugh, I will joke, I will have fun, but it's 100% straight every single time. I don't, I don't believe in a whole lot of like coloring things up outside of just being an idiot, right? In our listings though, I need people to trust that when I list their house, number one, it's gonna be beautiful. Number two, it's gonna be accurate. If I mess those things up, like my least favorite text, you guys, is when a seller sends in a message and says, hey, my listing information's wrong. <gasps> like, oh no, what did I miss? Is it truly hardwood floors or is it LVP? You know, did I miss the fact that there's a water software? You know, oh, the propane tank says it's leased. I actually own it. Like those are big things to a seller, right? So my brand is accuracy and professionalism, okay? So if a seller is working with me, they know they're getting a professional. The quickest way to not be a professional is to act unprofessional, which as we've already discussed is going to look like not having the right documents, uh, not utilizing great pictures or floor plans, and of course, not scheduling the listing. On your listings right now, this is the open house market. The, all of the leads are coming through open houses right now. I don't know if you guys have noticed this. Agents are bringing their people through open houses. Buyers are actually going to open houses again. I mean, you held a few here recently and have really good turnout on some of those. So what we got to do, number one, is we're going to list on Thursdays or Fridays. Why Thursdays or Fridays? It takes 24 to 48 hours for a listing to populate all of the syndication sites. As soon as we list it, we already have an open house scheduled. In the in-between time from the day it goes live until your open house, you are door knocking, circle calling, you are placing signs. And if you want to, you are sending letters to the neighborhood announcing your open house. You're also sending a mass email or mass text to your entire database telling them there's an open house and you're putting out Facebook marketing. Why? Get people through it. Oh, but that's part of it. it. That'll help to get more leads out of the house, right? Marketing a listing is actually marketing the open house. That's this market right now. So what we keep missing is like, hey, a new listing. Yay, share it. It's actually, no, we're marketing the open house, okay? So when you market the open house, that tells other sellers that you're going to work hard for them, right? So you're actually going to draw leads off of that marketing way better than just your Zillow listing or a new listing post. Your marketing for the open house will pull in new leads and then potentially they'll come to the open house. Typically, if it's a good house, we're selling it before it ever hits the open house, right? It's still that market, but we'll pull in new clients through the marketing efforts of that open house. Does that make sense? Okay. Again, that is the market of the moment right now is, is the, uh, the open house. Okay, we're going here. Uh, yep, yeah. okay, don't do that. Proper signage, put a sign out there. Put your name and writer on it. Pretty easy one. Holy crap, we're getting so close. How much time do I have, Shanna? Negative one minute? Cool. Yeah, negative one. You just keep going. Oh, look, it's only one slide. Look at that. Success with co-agents. No, ahas. Uh -huh. Perfect. Okay. So I'm going to take us a couple seconds here. I've talked about this one before. Number one, how many of you guys have worked a job other than real estate? Okay. How many of you at those other jobs have had a co-worker that you really did not like? Okay. Real estate's no different, just in case you're wondering. Like, there's plenty of us out there. And we tend to come from a really diverse background in this group. Um, with that being said, the better co-agent you are, 
the more likely that you're going to do more business. So this is kind of a wild concept. When I take a new listing, and I know I've worked with people or agents that tend to sell a certain type of home. For instance, when I take a wild horse listing, I'm immediately calling Andy Trussell. I'm saying, Andy, who's the greatest guy of all time, by the way, Andy Trussell. Andy, I'm taking a wild horse listing. Took it right out of your bit, your back pocket, you sucker. Here's what I need you to do. I need you to find me a buyer, right? And I'm sending Andy all the details. The last two I've listed in Wild Horse, we sold off market, right? So Andy satisfies his own buyer pool through being a great cooperative agent, right? And then in my context, I get to satisfy my seller by reaching into his buyer pool because we co-op really well together. Carrie Worsh, Adam Grady is another one. I think we've probably sold four in the last five days with them. If either our listings or their listings, we're just trading clients back and forth, basically. You know, being a great cooperative agent makes people want to come back to you. It's also why you've got my information and Sam's information. Selfishly, I want to share everything I can with you guys because I want you guys to sell our houses, right? I want you guys to find value in what we do and think of us as great cooperative agents so that we can grow our businesses together. This business is way less uh, like, I don't know how to say this. Okay, it is a very competitive business in that we do tend to compete for a limited number of buyers and sellers. Yet at the same time, that number is so big that we can both have massive businesses in the same market and live massively abundant lives. Okay, 11,000, I think it was like 10,000 transactions last year. Might have been like nine. Okay, 9,000 transactions happened last year. That includes both buy sides and list sides. So technically like 4,500 homes in the Springfield market. So if 9,000 sides happened, there's no way my business could satisfy 9,000, right? There's no way anyone's business in here, even us collectively, could not service 9,000 buyers and sellers in a single year. So because of that, when you meet great cooperative agents, you'll find that the majority of the market is sold by a really a small group. Roughly about 300 agents sell the majority of our market, right? How do they get there? They are great cooperative agents. They work really well at putting deals together. Now, some don't, but I don't think they're long for the world, right? The ones with tenure, Janet Parsons comes to mind. Oh my gosh. By the way, do you know Adam Grady worked for Janet Parsons once upon a time? Janet Parsons has been in this market longer than, well, a lot of people. Maybe not Fawn Lee. I think Fawn Lee's got her beat. Fawn Lee Harley. Anyway, Janet Parsons is the most wonderful cooperative agent you could ever have. I literally go to the MLS and look up Janet's listings to try to get my, bu my buyers to buy her listings. That's how great she is. She's been in this market forever. She knows everyone and she sells everything, right? She will have a lasting legacy in this market that goes beyond well what we could ever imagine. All we have to do is mimic that. Be wonderful to work with. Realize that 90% of this isn't personal, right? Now, we all raised our hands when we said we had coworkers we didn't like. There will be co-op agents you don't like and that's okay. Right. I've got a list that I'm like, if you write me an offer, I'm recommending it to no for my client. Like it's that bad sometimes. Okay. Does that mean it's wrong or right? Not necessarily, but being a great cooperative agent actually increases the odds of your offers and your listing selling, which is pretty amazing. Actually, if you think about it, just be a good person. It goes back to the Y4C2Ts. Okay. And daily success system. So I think I'm going to have to write a wrap up. You're laughing at me. Why are you laughing at me? This is the this is the wrap up part, Ooh. and this is where they do their independence. So you were right on time. My long term friends. <laughs> All right. Before I'm done, we just covered a shit ton of material. Is there any questions or anything you guys have? If you do, feel free to text or email me um, for any sort of like system document, transaction checklist, that kind of thing. I know Shannon's got some. You know, actually, did we send ours to you guys too, right? You stole the Vera stuff? I didn't steal the Vera stuff. Well, you know. it's rip off and duplicate. It's not. Yeah, that. that's what I'm saying. But if you want our, our newer lit and cute stuff, you can do, send that over here too. Um, but yeah, please. Uh, any questions or anything yet? Okay. All right, friends. Thank you for having me. Can you guys yeah. thank you? We so appreciate you taking time out of your day to really share your knowledge with everybody here. It was good stuff, right, guys? Yeah, it was. A lot of shit. Yeah. A lot stuff. Of stuff. stuff. A lot of stuff and things. Stuff, stuff and things.
very helpful uh, answer to so many questions. He's got a lot of ahas. So cool. awesome. I'm going to go ahead and shut this down. All right, I mean, if you guys need me, I'm always around somewhere. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, what do you think? It was yeah. so good, right? Very good. Yeah, very, very cool. Um, all right, let me end this. I've